I'm Lister Sinclair, and this is Ideas. The 1996 Massey Lectures, scheduled for this week, will not be heard. In their place, we present a rebroadcast of the 1990 Massey Lectures, entitled Biology as Ideology, The Doctrine of DNA, by Richard C. Lewontin. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation first commissioned the Massey Lectures back in 1961, and they've become an annual event ever since. Named in honour of the late Governor-General, Vincent Massey, the lecture series was created to present CBC listeners with the results of original research in important areas of contemporary thought. Over the years, the lectures have featured such distinguished contributors as Lady Barbara Ward-Jackson, George Grant, Martin Luther King, R.D. Lane, Carlos Fuentes, and last year, Ursula Franklin. Many of their lectures have gone on to become classics in their field. The 1990 Massey Lectures are presented by Richard C. Lewinton, distinguished evolutionary biologist and Alexander Agassiz, Professor of Zoology at Harvard University. Professor Lewinton's chief scientific work has been to study the nature of genetic variation within different populations. His theoretical and experimental contributions in this field have brought him many awards and honours, including fellowships in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Society for the Study of Evolution, of which he was the president, and the National Academy of Sciences. He has also written two textbooks on genetics, one co-authored with David Suzuki, among others. They required reading on university campuses across North America. But as well as being a practising scientist, Professor Lewontin has had a long-standing commitment to social change through social action, and he has succeeded in wedding his two passions throughout his life. In his early days, he worked with Buckminster Fuller, designing and building geodesic domes. In the 1960s, he was one of the few American scientists to speak out against the Vietnam War. He was active in distributing medical aid to Indochina and was a member of the organization Science for Vietnam. He was a founding member of Science for the People, an international organization aimed at promoting a science that is answerable to the majority of people rather than being at the service of an elite. He created quite an uproar when he resigned from the prestigious National Academy of Sciences over the issue of secret war research and in protest against the existence of such an elite organization. He is also on the board of directors of the Council on Responsible Genetics, which monitors and critiques the uses to which modern genetic research is put. In an effort to ensure that the public is adequately informed about science, Dr. Lewinton has also authored or co-authored a number of popular books on biology, including Human Diversity, a Scientific American publication, Education, IQ and Class, co-authored with Michelle Schiff, and Not in Our Genes, co-authored with Stephen Rose and Leo Kamin. He's also written numerous articles on the philosophy and sociology of science for the New York Review of Books and other publications. In his work to demystify science, Professor Lewinton continually exposes the ways in which science interacts with society, and he exhorts us to promote a democratic science which will be relevant to the building of a better world. His lecture tonight is titled Biology as Ideology, the Doctrine of DNA. I want to talk tonight, and in the four lectures that follow this one, about a social institution about which there's a great deal of misunderstanding, even among those who are part of it. That institution is science. Most of what I want to say will be specifically about biology, but biology is only a model of how science works in general. We think of science as an institution, as a set of methods, a set of people, a great body of knowledge that we call scientific knowledge. And we see it as somehow being pretty much apart from the forces that rule our everyday lives and that govern the structure of our society. Science is objective. And of course, science has brought us all kinds of good things. It has tremendously increased the production of food. It's increased our life expectancy from a mere 45 years at the beginning of the century to over 70 in rich countries like ours. It's put people on the moon, and it's made it possible to sit at home and watch the world go by. Of course, it's produced some horrors, too, like the nuclear bomb and pesticides that pollute our environment. 
But we believe that science just uncovers the facts, and it's society that either uses or misuses them for good or evil. What I want to say about science in these lectures is quite different. I want to try to convince you that science, like any other productive activity, like the state, like the family, like sport, is a social institution, and as such, it's completely integrated into and influenced by the rest of our social institutions. The problems that science deals with, the ideas that it uses in investigating those problems, even the so-called scientific results that come out of scientific investigation, are really all deeply influenced by predispositions that derive from the society in which we live. Scientists do not begin life, after all, as scientists. They begin as social beings, like everyone else, immersed in a family, a state, a productive structure, and they view nature through a lens that's been molded by their social experience. What else could they do? But even above that personal level of perception, science is molded by society because it's a human productive activity. It takes time. It takes money. Science uses commodities, and it produces commodities that are sold in the marketplace. People earn their living by it. I earn my living by it. And as a consequence, the dominant social and economic forces in society that control time and money determine to a large extent what science does and how it does it. But more than that, those people with access to power are able to appropriate from science ideas that are particularly suited to the maintenance and continued prosperity of existing social structures. I'm going to give many examples in my talks, but let me begin with one that's particularly prominent at the present. For some years now, women have been pressing a society dominated by men to give up that domination and to open all the avenues of power and control of their own lives to women. In an effort to legitimize the differential power of men in society, educational institutions controlled by men, like the one in which I work, and newspapers, magazines, radio, and TV that regularly report and popularize the claims of intellectuals have been producing all sorts of claims for the biological inferiority of women. It's instructive to see how one scientific claim follows another as different aspects of women's biology are said to be important. Sometimes it's claimed that women's bodies are simply too slight to carry out the heavy physical work of being, say, an electrician or a firefighter. Then it's said that women's hormones make them unreliable on a monthly basis. You wouldn't want a menstruating woman flying an airplane, would you? Most recently, we've heard that the structure of women's brains make them worse at mathematics and other serious cognitive work, although they're fine at intuition because they use the left halves of their brains, whereas men use the right cognitive halves. Finally, we've been told that women use both halves of their brains more than men do, so that women can't think about specialized things. Of course, all of these differences are said to be coded in our genes. So women do not have the genes for math, the genes for business, the genes for aggressiveness, the genes for all those things that are supposed to give power in society. Women are doomed by their genes to an inferior position. And no matter how well-intentioned we may be, we just have to face facts. Anatomy is destiny. So social institutions have an input into science, both in what's done and how it's thought about. And they take from science concepts and ideas which then support those institutions and make them seem legitimate and natural. It's this dual process that is meant when I say science is an ideology. Look, science serves two functions. First, it provides us with new ways of manipulating the material world. It produces a set of techniques, practices, inventions, by which new things are produced and by which the quality of our lives is changed. These are the aspects of science to which scientists appeal when they try to get money from governments or when they appear on the front pages of newspapers in their public relations pressures to support their continued prosperity. We read repeatedly about how science has discovered something. But more often than not, these announcements are hedged around with all sorts of qualifiers. Biologists discover evidence for genes that may one day lead to a possible cure for cancer. While their over-optimistic reports breed a certain cynicism, it's nevertheless true that scientists do actually change the way in which we confront the material world. The second function of science, which is sometimes independent and sometimes closely related to the first, 
is the function of explanation. Even if scientists are not actually changing the material mode of our existence, they're constantly explaining why things are the way they are. They're producing theories about the world. It's often said that those theories must be produced in order ultimately to change the world through practice. After all, how can we cure cancer unless we understand what causes cancer? How can we increase our food production unless we understand the laws of genetics and plant and animal nutrition? Yet it's remarkable how much really important practical science has been quite independent of theory. In a later talk, I'm going to consider one of the most famous examples of scientific agricultural change, the introduction of hybrid corn all over the world. Hybrid corn is claimed to be one of the great triumphs of modern genetics in action in helping to feed people and increase their well-being. Yet as a matter of fact, the development of hybrid corn, and indeed almost all of plant and animal breeding, as it's actually practiced, has been carried out in a way that's completely independent of any scientific theory about how it ought to work. Indeed, a great deal of plant and animal breeding has been done in a way indistinguishable from the methods of past centuries before anyone had ever heard of genetics. The same is true for our attempts to cope with killers like cancer and heart disease. Most cures for cancer are either the surgical removal of the growing tumor or its destruction with powerful radiations or chemicals. Virtually none of this progress in cancer therapy has occurred through a deep understanding of the elementary processes of cell growth and development. Although nearly all of the cancer research, above the purely clinical level, is devoted precisely to that understanding. So, despite all the talk of scientific medicine, medicine remains essentially an empirical process in which people do what works. If we look at the actual accomplishments of science, it's not at all clear that a correct understanding of how the world works is basic to many successful manipulations of the world. But explanations of how the world really works serve another purpose, one in which has been a remarkable success, irrespective of the practical truth of scientific claims. That purpose is legitimating society as we know it. Irrespective of what your political view may be, everyone has to agree that we live in a world in which psychic and material welfare is very unevenly distributed. There are rich people and poor people. There are sick people and healthy people. People who have control over the conditions of their own lives, like professors who give lectures on the radio, and those who have their tasks assigned to them, who are overseen, who have little or no control over any psychic or material aspects of their own lives, like the janitor who's going to come in and sweep up the studio when we're finished here. There are rich countries and poor countries. Some races dominate others. Men and women have very unequal social and material power. Some kind of inequality of status, wealth, health, and power have been characteristic of every society about which we know. That means that in every society about which we know, there's some form of struggle going on between those who have and those who have not, between those with social power and those who are deprived of it. The uprisings of blacks in American cities in the 1960s and 1970s in which there was a vast destruction of property and what you might call a radical redistribution of consumer goods, and the armed struggle of Mohawk Indians in Canada to prevent the encroachment of commercial and state power on their lands, are only the most recent examples of a long history of violent confrontations between those with status, wealth, and power and those without it. Repeated peasant uprisings in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries resulted in the wholesale destruction of crops and buildings and the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives. The deeds of peasant rebels like Pugachev and Stenkarazin in Eastern Europe live in song and story. It's obviously in the interest of those who have power in society to prevent such violent and destructive conflicts, even if, with the police power of the state, they're sure eventually to win. Repeatedly, as such struggles go on, there are created institutions whose function it is to forestall violent struggle by convincing people that the society in which they live is just and fair, or if it's not just and fair, that it's inevitable and it's quite useless to resort to violence. These are what we call institutions of social legitimation. They're just as much a part of the social struggle as the hayrick burnings and machine destructions of the Captain Swing riots in Britain in the 19th century that helped to populate Australia with their penal colonies. But they use very different weapons. They use ideological weapons. The battleground is now in people's heads, 
And if the battle is won on that ground, then the peace and tranquility of society are guaranteed. For almost the entire history of European society, since the empire of Charlemagne, the chief institution of social legitimation was the Christian church. It was by the grace of God that each person had his or her appointed place in society. Kings ruled de gratia. Of course, occasionally divine grace could be conferred on a commoner who was ennobled, and grace could be removed. Grace was removed from King Charles I, as Cromwell noted, and the proof was Charles' severed head. Even the most revolutionary of religious leaders pressed the claims of legitimacy for the sake of order. Martin Luther, that great religious revolutionary, enjoined his flock to obey their lords. And in his famous sermon on marriage, he asserted that justice was made for the sake of peace and not peace for the sake of justice. Peace is the ultimate social good, and justice is important only if it subserves peace. So women, obey your husbands. Now, for an institution to serve the function of explaining the world so as to make it legitimate, that institution has to possess several features. First, the institution as a whole must appear to derive from sources outside of ordinary human struggle. It must not seem to be the creation of political, economic, or social forces, but it has to descend into society from some superhuman source. Second, the ideas, the pronouncements, the rules, the results of that institution's activity must have a validity and a transcendent truth that goes beyond any possibility of human compromise or human error. Its explanations and pronouncements must seem to be true in an absolute sense and to derive somehow from some absolute source. They must be true for all time and all place. And finally, the institution must have a certain mystical and veiled quality so that its innermost operation is not completely transparent to everyone, to the man on the street. It must have an esoteric language which needs to be explained to the ordinary person by those who are especially knowledgeable and who can intervene between everyday life and the mysterious sources of understanding and knowledge. Obviously, the Christian church, or indeed any revealed religion, fits these requirements perfectly. And so religion has been an ideal institution for legitimating society. But you know, this description also fits science and has made it possible for science to replace religion as the chief legitimating force in modern society. After all, science claims a method that's objective and non-political. It's true for all time. Scientists truly believe that except for the unwanted intrusions of ignorant politicians, science is above the social fray. My teacher, a famous scientist who was a refugee from the Bolshevik Revolution and who detested the Bolsheviks, devoted a lot of energy to pointing out the serious scientific errors that were being made in the Soviet Union in biology and in genetics as a consequence of the unorthodox biological doctrines of T.D. Lysenko. I once pointed out to him that following his own political convictions, he ought not to carry on that campaign against Lysenko. After all, he believed that sooner or later a global conflict would occur with the United States and the Soviet Union on opposite sides. And he also believed that Lysenko's false scientific doctrines were severely weakening Soviet agricultural production. So why did he not then simply remain quiet about Lysenko's errors, so that the Soviet Union would be weakened and compromised in the conflict that was to come? His answer was that his obligation to speak the truth about science was superior to all other obligations, and that a scientist must never allow a political consideration to prevent him from saying what he believes to be true. Not only the methods and institutions of science are said to be above ordinary human relations, but of course the product of science is claimed to be a kind of universal truth. The secrets of nature are unlocked. Once the truth about nature is revealed, then no one can fight it. One must accept the facts of life. When science speaks, let no dog bark. Finally, science speaks in mysterious words. No one except an expert can understand what scientists say and do. And we require the mediation of special people, science journalists, for example, or professors who speak on the radio, to explain the mysteries of science, because otherwise there's nothing but indecipherable formulas. Nor can one scientist understand the formulas of another scientist. Once, when Sir Sally Zuckerman, the famous English zoologist, was asked what he does when he reads a scientific paper 
and comes across a mathematical formula, he said, oh, I hum them. Of course, despite its claims to be above society, science, like the church before it, is a supremely social institution, reflecting the dominant values and views of society at each historical epoch, as well as reinforcing them. Sometimes, the ways in which scientific theories are translated directly from social experience are obvious, even at a detailed level. The most famous case is Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. No scientist doubts that the organisms on Earth today have evolved over billions of years from organisms that were very unlike them, and that nearly all types of organisms have long since gone extinct. Moreover, we know this to be a natural process, resulting from the differential survivorship of different forms. In this sense, we all accept Darwinism as being true. But Darwin's explanation for that evolution is a very different matter. He claimed that there was a universal struggle for existence, because more organisms were born than could survive, and that in the course of that struggle for existence, those organisms that were more efficient, better designed, cleverer, and generally better built for the struggle would leave more offspring than the inferior kinds. As a consequence of this victory in the struggle for existence, evolutionary change occurred. But even Darwin himself was conscious of the source of his own ideas about the struggle for existence. He claimed that the idea for evolution by natural selection occurred to him after reading the famous Essay on Population by the Reverend Malthus, a late 18th century economist. That essay was an argument against the old English poor law, which provided welfare payments for the poor in their own homes. The landowners, for whom Malthus was a spokesman, wanted a much tougher law, in which the poor would receive minimal relief and only if they worked at hard labor in parish workhouses. Malthus supported this argument by claiming that all organisms, including human beings, reproduce too rapidly for the growth of their resources. Thus, if the poor were supported too liberally, they would simply reproduce more poor people, who would be a further drain on resources. The only solution was to let starvation take its inevitable and natural toll. Darwin saw in Malthus a universal principle, that all organisms are engaged in the struggle for existence in a world of insufficient resources. Therefore, only those who are more efficient and skillful would survive. By the competition between individuals, acting in their own narrow self-interest, all of evolutionary progress had taken place. This is precisely what Adam Smith argued when he claimed that individual economic competition would act as an invisible hand to make the economy as a whole act efficiently. In this way, Darwin's whole theory of evolution by natural selection bears an uncanny resemblance to the political economic theory of early capitalism. Darwin himself had some personal knowledge of the economic survival of the fittest because he got his living from investment in railroad shares, which he followed daily in the newspapers. What Darwin did was to take early 19th century political economy and expand it to include all of natural economy. Moreover, he developed a theory of sexual selection and evolution in which the chief force is the competition among males to be more appealing to discriminating females. This theory is meant to explain why male animals often display bright colors or complex mating dances. It's not clear that Darwin was conscious of how similar his view of sexual selection was to the standard 19th century Victorian view of the proper relationship between middle class males and middle class females. In reading Darwin's theory, one can see the proper young lady seated on her sofa while the swain on his knees before her begs for her hand, having already told her father how many hundreds a year he has an in income. Most of the ideological influence from society that permeates science is a great deal more subtle than this. It comes in the form of basic assumptions of which scientists themselves are usually not aware. Yet those assumptions have a profound effect on the forms of their explanations and in turn serve to reinforce social attitudes that gave rise to those explanations in the first place. One important example is the way scientists have interpreted the relation of individuals to collectivities, the famous problem of parts and wholes. Before the 18th century, European society placed little or no emphasis on the importance of the individual. 
On the contrary, the activity of people was determined by the social class into which they were born, except in very exceptional cases. And individual people confronted each other as representatives of their social groups. In a dispute, for example, between a priest and a merchant over some commercial matter, the priest would make his case in an ecclesiastical court before his bishop, and the merchant in the court of his own lord, rather than both being subject to the same uniform judgment. Individuals were not seen as the causes of social arrangements, but as their consequence. Moreover, people were not free to move in the economic hierarchy. Peasants and lords alike had mutual obligations and were bound to each other by those obligations. There were no freely moving competitive labor forces where each person had the power to sell his or her own labor power in the labor market. Those relations made it quite impossible to develop the kind of productive capitalism that marks our own era, in which freedom for individuals to move from place to place, from task to task, from status to status, to confront each other sometimes as buyers and sometimes as sellers, sometimes as owners and sometimes as tenants, sometimes as producers and sometimes as consumers, is an absolute necessity. For example, serfdom had to be abolished in Russia in the middle of the 19th century because there was a shortage of factory labor, and serfs were prohibited by law from being sent to factories. Sometimes, in fact, serf owners illegally shipped their peasants into factories, and we know that serfs petitioned the Tsar for relief. Just as social organization was seen as an indissoluble whole, so was nature. Living and dead could be transformed one into the other, provided one knew the mystical formula. Nature could not be understood by taking it into pieces, because by doing so, one destroyed what was essential to it. Alexander Pope said, It was like following life through creatures you dissect. You lose it in the moment you detect. One consequence was that human anatomy and the functions of various organs could not be understood, because one could not dissect them, nor could one look at each organ separately as having a separate function. Another was that herbs and roots were regarded as treatments for various parts of the body if their shape was similar to those parts. So, for example, mandrake root, which looked like a little baby or a small human, was supposed to be good for infertility. With the change in social organization that was brought about by developing industrial capitalism, a whole new view of society arose, one in which the individual was primary and independent, a kind of autonomous social atom that could move from place to place and roll to roll. Society is now thought to be the consequence, not the cause of individual properties. It's individuals who together make society. Modern economics is grounded in the theory of consumer preference. Individual autonomous firms compete with each other and replace each other. Individuals have power over their own bodies and their own labor power in what we call possessive individualism. This atomized society is matched by a new view of nature, the reductionist view. Now it is believed that the whole is to be understood only by taking it into pieces, that the individual bits and pieces, the atoms, molecules, cells, genes, are the causes of the properties of the whole objects and must be separately studied if we are to understand complex nature. Darwin's theory of evolution was a theory of the differential reproductive rate of individuals. Those individuals with certain traits, certain properties that made them more efficient, that made them use the resources of the limited world better, would leave more offspring. And the consequence would be that the species as a whole would evolve toward those more efficient and those better forms. All of the phenomena of evolution could be understood at this individual causal level. All of modern biology, and indeed all of modern science, takes as its informing metaphor the clock mechanism described by René Descartes in part five of his Discours. Descartes, being religious, excluded the human soul from the universal clock, but that very soon came to be included as well. Modern science sees the world, both living and dead, as a large and complicated system of gears and levers. A second feature of the transformation of scientific views in the industrial era has been the clear separation between causes and effects. Things are supposed to be either one or the other. 
Again, in Darwin's view, organisms were acted upon by the environment. They were the passive objects, and the external world was the active subject. This alienation of the organism from its outside world means that the outside world has its own laws that are independent of the organisms, and so cannot be changed by those organisms. Organisms find the world as it is, and they must either adapt or die. Nature, love it or leave it. It's the natural analog of the old saw that you can't fight City Hall. As we'll see in a later lecture, this is an impoverished and incorrect view of the actual relationship between organisms and the world they occupy, a world which they by and large create by their own living activities. So the ideology of modern science, and especially of modern biology, makes the properties of individuals the causal source of all the properties of larger collectivities. It prescribes a way of studying the world which is to cut it up into little bits and pieces, the bits and pieces that cause it, and to study the properties of those bits in isolation. It breaks the world up into independent, autonomous domains, the internal and the external. Causes are either internal or external, and there is no mutual dependency between them. For biology, this worldview has resulted in a particular picture of organisms and their total life activity. Living beings are seen as being determined by internal factors, the genes. Our genes and the DNA molecules that make them up are the modern form of the old religious doctrine of grace. Either you have it when you're born or you don't. There's nothing you can do in life to acquire it. You either are in a state of grace or you are not. In the same way, biologists claim that some of us are born with the genes that make us intelligent, that make us aggressive, that give us wonderful temperaments, that make us possible to be successful in life, and others are born with genes that destine us uh, to be imposed on by others, to be poor, to be unhealthy. According to this view, we will only understand what we are when we know what our genes are made of. The world outside us poses certain problems which we do not create, but only experience as objects. The problems are to find a mate, to find food, to win out in competition over others, to acquire a large part of the world resources as our own. And if we have the right kinds of genes, we'll be able to solve those problems and we'll leave more offspring. So, according to this view, it's really our genes that are propagating themselves through us. We are only their instruments, their temporary vehicles, through which the genes that make us up either succeed or fail to spread through the world. In the words of Richard Dawkins, one of the leading proponents of this biological view, we are lumbering robots whose genes control us body and mind. Just as at one level, genes determine individuals, so at the next level, it's individuals that determine collectivities. If we want to understand, for example, why an ant colony has the particular division of tasks that it has, or a flock of birds flies in a particular way, we need only to look at the individual ants and the individual birds, because the behavior of the group is a consequence of the individual behaviors of the single organisms, which of course are in turn determined by their genes. For human beings, that view means that the structure of our society is seen as nothing but the result of the collection of individual behaviors. If our country goes to war, it's because we feel aggressive as individuals. If we live in a competitive, entrepreneurial society, it's because each one of us, as an individual, has a drive to be competitive and entrepreneurial. Genes make individuals, and individuals make society, and so genes make society. If one society is different from another, that's because the genes of the individuals in one society are different from the genes in another. Different races are thought to be genetically different in how aggressive or creative or musical they may be. Indeed, culture as a whole is seen as made up of little bits and pieces of cultural bric-a-brac, what some sociobiologists call culture gens. A culture is simply a sack of bits and pieces, like aesthetic preferences, mating preferences, work and leisure preferences. Dump out the sack, and culture will be displayed before you. So the hierarchy is complete. Genes make individuals, individuals have particular preferences and behaviors, and the collection of preferences and behaviors makes a culture. And so, genes make a culture. 
That's why molecular biologists are urging us to spend as much money as necessary to get the sequence of all of the DNA that makes up the genes of a human being. Because they say, when we know the sequence of the molecules that make up all our genes, we will know what it is to be human. When we know what our DNA looks like, we will know why some of us are rich and some are poor, some are healthy and some are sick, some are powerful and some are weak. We'll also know why some societies are powerful and rich and others are weak and poor, why one nation, one sex, one race dominates another. Indeed, we'll know why there's such a thing as a science of biology, which is itself one of the bits and pieces of culture lying at the bottom of the sack. We've become so used to the atomistic machine view of the world that originated with Descartes that we have really forgotten that it's a metaphor. We no longer think, as Descartes did, that the world is like a clock. We think it is a clock. We cannot imagine an alternative view unless it be one that goes back in history to a pre-scientific era. For those who are dissatisfied, and properly so, with the modern world, and dislike the artifacts of science, the pollution, the noise, the industrial world, the wars, the over-mechanized medical care that seems not to make us feel better much of the time, for people who want to go back to nature in the good old ways, the response has been to return to a description of the world as an indissoluble whole which we murder to dissect. For them, there's no use in trying to break anything down into any parts because we lose the essence inevitably and the best we can do is to treat the world holistically. But this so-called holistic worldview is not tenable. It's simply another form of mysticism, and it does not make it possible to manipulate the world for our own benefit. An obscurantist holism has been tried, and it's failed. Thinking good thoughts and visualizing one's tumor has not cured cancer. Eating macrobiotic diets has ruined people's health. It has not improved their nutrition. So-called holistic medicine, despite the anecdotal testimony of a few, has proved no more curative than prayer. The world is not one huge organism that regulates itself to some good end, as the believers in the Gaia hypothesis believe. There is not a shred of evidence for such a self-regulating system. 99.999% of all the species that have ever lived are already extinct, and the rate of extinction at the present is about what it was a billion years ago. In three billion years from now, the Earth will be burned to a cinder by an expanding sun, so life is half over. Universal balance and harmony are ideologies, pure and simple, invoked in an understandable revulsion against the soulless ideology of Adam Smith's invisible hand. While in some theoretical sense, the trembling of a flower is felt on the farthest star. In practice, my gardening really does not have an effect on the orbit of Neptune because the forces of gravitation are extremely weak and they fall off very rapidly with distance. So there's clearly truth in the belief that the world can be broken up into independent parts. But that is not a universal direction for how to study all of nature. A lot of nature, as we shall see, cannot be broken up into independent parts that are to be studied in isolation, and it is pure ideology to suppose that they can. The problem is to construct a third view, one that sees the entire world neither as an indissoluble whole, nor with the equally incorrect but presently dominant view that at every level the world is made up of bits and pieces that can be isolated and that have properties that can be studied in isolation. Both of these ideologies, one that mirrors the pre-modern feudal social world and the other that mirrors the modern competitive individualistic entrepreneurial world, prevent us from seeing the full richness of interaction in nature. In the end, they prevent a real understanding of nature and prevent us from solving the problems to which science is supposed to apply itself. In the lectures that follow this one, I look in some detail at particular manifestations of the modern scientific ideology and the false paths down which it has led us. I'll consider how biological determinism has been used to explain and justify inequalities within and between societies, and to claim that those inequalities can never really be changed because they are fixed in our genes. We will see how a theory of human nature has been developed, 
using Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, to claim that social organization is also unchangeable because it has been fixed in our genes and because it is natural. We will see how problems of health and disease have been located within the individual and within the individual's genes so that the individual becomes a problem for society to cope with rather than society becoming a problem for the individual to cope with. And we will see how simple economic relations masquerading as facts of nature can drive the entire direction of biological research and technology. While these lectures are meant, frankly, to disillusion the listener about the objectivity and the vision of transcendent truth claimed by scientists, they're not intended to be anti-scientific or to suggest that we should give up science in favor of astrology or thinking beautiful thoughts. Rather, they're meant to acquaint the listener with the truth about science as a social activity and to promote a reasonable skepticism about the sweeping claims that modern science makes to an understanding of human existence. But there's an important difference between skepticism and cynicism. For the former, skepticism can lead to action, and the latter, cynicism, leads only to passivity. So these lectures have a political end, too, and that is to encourage the listeners not to leave science to the experts, not to be mystified by it, but to demand a sophisticated scientific understanding in which everyone can share. The 1990 Massey Lectures, presented by Richard C. Lewinton, continue tomorrow night on Ideas. I'm Lister Sinclair, and this is Ideas. The 1996 Massey Lectures scheduled for this week will not be heard. In their place, we present a rebroadcast of the 1990 Massey Lectures, entitled Biology as Ideology, the Doctrine of DNA, by Richard C. Lewinton. The Massey Lectures have been an annual event on CBC Radio since 1961. They are commissioned by the CBC to present the work of leading intellectuals in the humanities, the arts, politics, and the physical and social sciences. The 1990 Massey Lectures are presented by Richard C. Lewinton, distinguished evolutionary biologist and Alexander Agassiz Professor of Zoology at Harvard University. Last night, Professor Lewinton set out to disprove the popular claim that science is objective, that it is somehow above the social and political fray. He claimed that far from being objective, science reflects the dominant social ideology. The problems that science deals with, the methods that it uses in investigating those problems, and even the way scientific results are interpreted, are influenced, says Dr. Lewontin, by predispositions that come from the society in which we live. And he claims that science in turn serves to justify and legitimize the existing social order. So it's no accident, for example, that as women's liberation began to take hold, there were all sorts of scientific studies done which proved that women were, by their very nature, not suited to power. Similar studies have popped up periodically which justify racial and class inequality. Professor Lewinton claims that this kind of biological determinism has been one of the chief ideological weapons of those who have power in their effort to hold on to their power. Professor Lewinton is well placed to critique the claims of biological determinists. His chief scientific work has been to study the nature of genetic differences in populations, and he has contributed important molecular methodologies which have advanced the work in this field. Armed with his research findings, much of his political energy has been devoted to debunking the claims of biological determinists. It was to this end that he co-authored the widely read book Not in Our Genes with Stephen Rose and Leo Kamen. Tonight, Professor Lewinton continues with part two of Biology as Ideology, the Doctrine of DNA. The society we live in today was born at least politically in revolutions in the 17th century in Britain and in the 18th century in France and America. Those revolutions 
swept out an old order that was characterized by aristocratic privilege and a lack of social mobility of persons in society. The bourgeois revolutions in England, in France, and America claimed that this old society and its ideology were illegitimate, and the ideologues of those revolutions produced and legitimized a new ideology of liberty and equality. Diderot and the encyclopedists and Tom Paine were the theorists of a society of liberté, égalité, and fraternité, of all men created equal. The writers of the American Declaration of Independence asserted that political truths were self-evident, and what was self-evident was that all men were created equal, that they were endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these is the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, by which, of course, they meant the pursuit of money. They meant literally all men because women were not given the right to vote in the United States until 1920, in Britain until 1928, and indeed in Quebec, not until 1940. And of course, they didn't mean all men because slavery continued in the French dominions and in the Caribbean until the middle of the 19th century. And blacks were defined by the United States Constitution as only three-fifths of a person. And for most of the history of English parliamentary democracy, you had to have money to vote. To make a revolution, you need slogans that appeal to the great mass of people. And you can hardly get people to shed blood under a banner that reads, Equality for Some. So the ideology and the slogans outstrip the reality. For if we look around at the society that has been created by those revolutions, we see, in fact, a great deal of inequality. Inequality of wealth and power among individuals, between sexes, between races, and between nations. Yet we have heard over and over again in school and had it drummed into us by every organ of communication that we live in a society of free equals. The contradiction between the claimed equality of our society and the observation that great inequalities exist has been, for North Americans at least, the major social agony of the last 200 years. It has motivated an extraordinary amount of our political history. How are we to cope with immense inequalities in a society that claims to be founded on equality. Well, there are two possibilities. One, we can say that it's all a fake, a set of slogans meant to replace a regime of aristocrats with a new regime of wealth and privilege of a different kind. That inequality in our society is structural and an integral aspect of the whole of our political and social life. To say that, however, would be deeply subversive because it would call for yet another revolution if we wanted to make good on our hopes for liberty and equality for all. It's not an idea that's very popular among teachers, newspaper editors, college professors, radio producers, or successful politicians, indeed anyone who has the power to help form public consciousness. The alternative, which has been the one taken since the beginning of the 19th century, has been to put a new gloss on the notion of equality. Rather than the equality of result, what has been meant is equality of opportunity. In this view of equality, life's a foot race. In the bad old days of the Ancien Régime, the aristocrats got to start at the finish line, whereas all the rest of us had to start at the beginning. So, of course, the aristocrats won. In the new society, the race is supposed to be fair. Everyone is to begin at the starting line, and everyone has an equal opportunity to come in first. Of course, some people are faster runners than others, and so, of course, some get rewards and others don't. According to this view, the old society was characterized by artificial barriers to equality, whereas the new society allows a natural sorting process to decide who's to get the status, who's to get the wealth, who's to get the power, and who is not. Nature and biology become the chief arbiters. Such a view does not threaten the status quo, but on the contrary supports it by telling those who are without power that their position is the inevitable outcome of their own innate deficiencies, and that therefore nothing can be done about it. A remarkably explicit recent statement of this assertion is the one by Richard Herrnstein, a professor of psychology from Harvard who is one of the leading modern ideologues of natural inequality. In an extremely popular book of 1973, he wrote, 
The privileged classes of the past were probably not much superior biologically to the downtrodden, which is why revolution had a fair chance of success. By removing artificial barriers between classes, society has encouraged the creation of biological barriers. When people can take their natural level in society, the upper classes will, by definition, have greater capacity than the lower. Of course, we're not told precisely what principle of biology guarantees that biologically inferior persons cannot seize power from biologically superior ones, but it's not the logic that's at issue here. Such statements are meant to convince us that although we may not live in the best of all conceivable worlds, we live in the best of all possible worlds. The social entropy has been maximized so that we have as much equality as possible because the structure is essentially one of equality. And whatever inequalities are left over are not structural, but are based on innate differences between individuals. In the 19th century, this was also the view. And education was seen, as it is now, as the lubricant that would guarantee that the race of life was to run smoothly. Lester Frank Ward, a giant of 19th century sociology, wrote, Universal education is the power which is destined to overthrow every species of hierarchy. Of course, he didn't mean every species, because he went on to say, It is destined to remove all artificial inequality and to leave the natural inequalities to find their true level. The true value of a newborn infant lies in its naked capacity for acquiring the ability to do. This sentiment was echoed in 1969 by Professor Arthur Jensen, a psychologist at the University of California, who wrote about the inequality of intelligence of blacks and whites. He said, We have to face it. The assortment of persons into occupational roles simply is not fair in any absolute sense. The best we can hope for is that true merit, given a quality of opportunity, acts as a basis for the natural assorting process. This view of Jensen's has become the received wisdom among biologists up until the present time. Simply to assert that the race of life is fair and that different people have different intrinsic abilities to run it is not alone sufficient to explain the observations of inequality. After all, children seem by and large to acquire the social status of their parents. About 60% of the children of blue-collar workers remain blue-collar, while about 70% of white-collar workers' children are white-collar. But even these figures vastly overestimate the amount of social mobility. Most people who have passed from blue-collar to white-collar jobs have passed from factory production line jobs to office production line jobs, or become sales clerks, jobs that are less well-paid, less secure, and just as soul-destroying as the factory work done by their parents. The children of gas station attendants usually borrow money, and the children of oil magnets usually lend it. The chance that Nelson Rockefeller would have wound up pumping gas in a standard oil station was pretty close to zero. If we live in a meritocracy in which each person can rise to the status allowed by his or her innate capacities, how do we explain this passage of social power from parent to offspring? Are we really just back in the old aristocratic situation? The naturalistic explanation is to say that not only do we differ in our innate capacities, but those very innate capacities are transmitted from generation to generation biologically. That is to say, they're in our genes. The original social and economic notion of inheritance has been turned into biological inheritance. But even the claim that the intrinsic ability to win success is inherited in the genes is not sufficient to justify an unequal society. After all, I could claim that there ought not to be any particular relationship between what one can accomplish and what social and psychic rewards are given. We might give the same material and psychic rewards to house painters and picture painters, to surgeons and to barbers, to professors who give lectures on the radio, and to the janitors who come in and clean up the studio afterwards. In the famous phrase, we might create a society on whose banners are inscribed, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. To meet this objection, there has been developed a biological theory of human nature, which says that while the differences between us are in our genes, there are certain inborn similarities among us all, similarities of human nature that are also in our genes, 
and that have been put into those genes by millions of years of evolution. These similarities guarantee that differences in ability will be converted into differences in status, that society is naturally hierarchical, and that a society of equal reward and equal status is biologically impossible. That is the message of such well-known books as On Human Nature by the eminent sociobiologist E.O. Wilson, and of all the human sociobiology that has flowed from it in the last 20 years. We might pass laws requiring equality, but the moment the vigilance of the state is relaxed, we would return to doing what comes naturally. These three ideas, first, that we differ in fundamental abilities because of innate differences, second, that those innate differences are biologically inherited, and third, that human nature guarantees the formation of a hierarchical society, when taken all together, form what we can call the ideology of biological determinism. The idea that blood will tell was not invented by biologists. It's a dominant theme of 19th century literature, for example, and one can hardly appreciate the most praised and popular writers of the last century without seeing how a theory of innate difference informed their work. Think of Dickens' Oliver Twist. When Oliver first meets young Jack Dawkins, the artful dodger on the road to London, a remarkable contrast in body and spirit is established. The dodger is described as a snub-nosed, flat-browed, common-faced boy with bow legs and little ugly eyes. And his English was not the best. But what can we expect from a ten-year-old street urchin with no family, no education, and only the lowest criminals of London for companions? Oliver's speech, however, is perfect, and his manner is genteel. He is described as a pale, thin child, but with a good, sturdy spirit in his breast. His pronunciation is of the best. His grammar is perfect. He uses a subjunctive. Yet Oliver was raised from birth in the most degrading of 19th century British institutions, the parish workhouse, with no mother, no education, and little to eat. He's described as having spent the first nine years of his life rolling about on the floor all day without the inconvenience of too much food or too much clothing. Where, amid the oakum pickings, did Oliver garner that sensitivity of soul and perfection of English grammar? Oliver Twist is a mystery novel, and that's its mystery. The answer is that although his food was gruel, his blood was upper middle class. His mother was the daughter of a naval officer. His father's family was well off and socially ambitious. Nor is this only a madness of the Anglo-Saxons. The rougon macau novels of Émile Zola were deliberately written as a kind of experimental literature to illustrate the discoveries of 19th century anthropology. In the preface, Zola tells us that heredity has its laws just like gravitation. The rougon macau are a family descended from the two lovers of one woman, one of whom was a solid, industrious peasant, while the other was a wastrel and degenerate. From the dependable peasant descend solid, honest stock, while from the degenerate ancestor descend a long line of social misfits and criminals, including the famous Nana, who was an infomaniac from early childhood, and whose mother Gervaise, the laundress, despite beginning a solid entrepreneurial life, lapses back into her natural indolence. The public consciousness of the 19th century, both in Europe and North America, was permeated with the notion that intrinsic differences in temperament and merit will finally dominate any mere effect of education and environment. The fictional rougon Macau are seen again in the equally fictional but supposedly real family of Calicax, who graced virtually every textbook of American psychology until the Second World War. The Calicax were supposed to be two halves of a family descended from two women of contrasting nature and a common father. This piece of academic fiction was meant to convince malleable young minds that criminality, laziness, alcoholism, and incest were really inborn and inherited. Nor were supposedly innate differences restricted to individual variation. Nations and races were said to be characterized by innate temperamental and intellectual differences. These claims were made not by racists, demagogues, and fascist know-nothings, but by the leaders of American academic, psychological, and sociological establishments. In 1923, 
Carl Brigham, who was later secretary of the College Entrance Examination Board, produced a study of intelligence under the direction of R.M. Yerkes, professor of psychology at Harvard and the president of the American Psychological Association, which asserted, among other things, that we must assume that we are measuring inborn intelligence. We must face the possibility of racial admixture here in America that is infinitely worse than that faced by any European country, for we are incorporating the Negro into our racial stock. The decline of the American intelligence will be more rapid owing to the presence here of the Negro. Yet another president of the American Psychological Association said that whenever there has been mixed breeding with the Negro, there has been deterioration of civilizations. Louis Agassiz, one of the most famous zoologists of the 19th century, and I, by the way, am the Agassiz professor of zoology, asserted that the skull sutures of Negro babies closed earlier than the sutures of white babies, so that their brains were entrapped and it would be dangerous to teach them too much. Perhaps the most extraordinary of claims was that of Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was president of the American Museum of Natural History and America's most eminent and prestigious paleontologist. He wrote, The northern races invaded the countries to the south, not only as conquerors, but as contributors of strong moral and intellectual elements to a more or less decadent civilization. Through the Nordic tide which flowed into Italy, came the ancestors of Raphael, Leonardo, Galileo, Tiziano, also, according to Gunther, of Giotto, Botticelli, Petrarca, and Tasso. Columbus, from his portraits and from busts, whether authentic or not, was clearly of Nordic ancestry. Authentic or not, indeed. Over and over again, leading intellectuals have assured their audiences that modern science shows that there are inborn racial and individual differences in ability. Nor have modern biologists taken a different view. Except for a brief interruption around the time of the Second World War, when the crimes of Nazism made claims of innate inferiority extremely unpopular, biological determinism has been the mainstream commitment of biologists till the present day. The post-war wave of biological determinism really began in 1969 with the publication of a famous article called How Much Can We Boost IQ and Scholastic Achievement in the Harvard Educational Review. This article was written by a professor of psychology from the University of California, Arthur Jensen. What soon became known all over as Jensenism argued that the inferior position of blacks in American society was a consequence of their genetic inferiority in intelligence. This was amplified four years later by Professor Richard Herrnstein, a Harvard psychologist, when he claimed that middle and lower classes were biologically different and that increasingly the lower classes were biologically doomed to their inferior position. When American cities erupted in urban riots and rebellion, respectable professors of anatomy and neurology argued that brain lesions were responsible for violent social action and that only surgery could prevent the burning down of American cities. Nor has the tide of determinism abated since. Every week sees another report of finding the genes for alcoholism, schizophrenia, drug taking, antisocial behavior, and violence. Or if the genes have not been found, they need to be sought. Just last month, in the pages of the New York Times, James Watson, the eminent Nobel Prize winner in biology, called for a support of a multi-billion dollar program to sequence the molecular structure of all human genes, in part because it would help us find the genes for depression and alcoholism. In the October 12th issue of Science Magazine, the leading scientific journal in North America, there's an extensive report on studies of twins claiming substantial influence of genes not only on intelligence, but also on occupational interest, traditionalism, and religiosity. These claims are made without a shred of evidence and in contradiction to every principle of biology and genetics. To realize the error of these claims, we need to understand what is really involved in the development of an organism. First, we are not determined by our genes, although surely we are influenced by them. Development 
depends on the materials that have been inherited from our parents, that is, the genes and other materials in the sperm and egg, but also on the particular temperature, humidity, nutrition, smell, sights and sounds, including what we call education, that are impinging on a developing organism. Even if I knew the complete molecular specification of every gene in an organism, I could not tell what that organism will be. Of course, the difference between lions and lambs is almost certainly a consequence of the difference in genes between them. But variations among individuals within species are a unique consequence of both genes and the developmental environment in constant interaction. Even if I knew the genes of a developing organism, and if I knew the complete sequence of its environments, I could not specify the organism. There's yet another factor at work. For example, if we count the number of bristles underneath the wing of a fruit fly, something which zoologists are constantly doing, we will find that there are a different number on the left side than on the right side. There's no average difference between left and right among fruit flies. Some have more bristles on the left and some more on the right. So there's a kind of fluctuating asymmetry. An individual fruit fly, however, has the same genes on its left side as it has on its right side, just as we have the same genes on our left side and our right sides. Moreover, the tiny size of a developing fruit fly and the place in which it develops guarantee that both the left and right sides have had the same humidity, the same oxygen, the same temperature. So the differences between left and right sides are neither caused by genetic nor by environmental differences. These differences are caused by random variation in growth and division of cells during development. This is what we call developmental noise. This chance element in development turns out to cause a lot of variation. Indeed, in the case of the fruit fly bristles, there is as much variation consequent on developmental noise as there is from genetic and environmental variation. We do not know, in fact, in human beings, how much of the difference between us is a consequence of random differences in the growth of neurons during our embryonic life and early childhood. It's my own prejudice that even if I had practiced the violin from a very early age, I would not be able to play as well as Yehudi Menuhin. And I think of him as having very special neuronal connections. But that's not the same as saying that those neuronal connections were coded in his genes. There may be large random differences in the growth of our central nervous systems. It's a fundamental principle of developmental genetics that every organism is the outcome of a unique interaction between genes and environmental sequences modulated by the random chances of cell growth and division, and that all these together finally produce an organism. Moreover, an organism changes throughout its entire life. Human beings change their size, for instance, not only growing larger as they change from children to adults, but growing smaller again as they grow old and their joints and bones shrink a little. A more sophisticated version of genetic determinism and one that permeates all the work on the heritability of intelligence, for example, agrees that organisms are a consequence of both environmental and genetic influences, but describes differences between individuals as differences in capacity. This is what I call the empty bucket metaphor. We begin life as empty buckets of different sizes. If we only provide a little bit of water, then all those buckets will have the same small amount in them. But if we provide a superabundance from the environment, then the little buckets will overflow and the larger ones will hold more. In this view, if every person were allowed to develop to his or her genetic capacity, then there would indeed be major differences in ability and performance, and these would be fair and natural. But there's no more biology in the metaphor of innate capacity than there is in the notion of fixed genetic effects. The unique interaction between organism and environment cannot be described by differences in capacity. So, it's true that if two genetically different organisms developed in exactly the same environment, they would be different. But that difference cannot be described as different capacities because the genetical type that was superior in one environment may be inferior in a second environment. For example, Strains of rats can be selected for better or poorer ability to find their way through a maze. And those strains of rats pass on their differential ability to run the maze to their offspring. So there are certainly genetically different rats in this respect. But if exactly the same strains of rats were given a different task, 
or if the conditions of learning are changed, the bright rats turn out to be dull and the dull rats turn out to be bright. There is no general genetic superiority of one rat strain over another in finding its way through a problem. An even more subtle and more mystifying approach to biological determinism rejects both the genetic fixity of the first view and the capacity metaphor of the second, and is instead statistical. Essentially, it states that the problem is one of partitioning the effects of the environment and the genes so that we can say that perhaps 80% of the difference among individuals is due to their genes and 20% due to their environment. It is often said, for example, on the basis of twin studies, that 80% of the variation among individual children in their IQ performance is caused by variation in their genes, and only 20% is caused by variation in their environments. This is the view used, for example, by Professor Jensen in his article, How Much Can We Boost IQ and Scholastic Achievement? The implication is that if most of the variation among individuals in, say, intelligence is a consequence of variation among their genes, then manipulating the environment will not make much difference. This is a completely fallacious, although plausible sounding argument. There is, in fact, no connection whatsoever between the amount of variation that can be ascribed to genetic differences as opposed to environmental differences and whether or not a change in the environment will affect performance or by how much. We should remember that any very ordinary arithmetic student in primary school in Canada can correctly add a column of figures vastly more quickly than the most intelligent ancient Roman mathematician who had to struggle with a cumbersome set of X's, V's, and I's. That same ordinary student can multiply two five-digit numbers together with a $10 handheld calculator more quickly and accurately than any professor of mathematics could have done in the 19th century. A change in environment, in this case of cultural environment, can change abilities by many orders of magnitude. Moreover, the differences between individuals are abolished by cultural and mechanical inventions. Differences that are ascribable to genetic differences and that appear in one environment may disappear completely in another. For example, there may be biologically based differences in physique and strength between a random group of men and a random group of women, although these are less than usually supposed. But these differences rapidly become irrelevant and disappear from practical view in a world of electrically driven hoists, power steering, and electronic controls. So the proportion of variation in a population that is a consequence of variation in genes is not a fixed property, but one that varies from environment to environment. Conversely, how much difference there is between us that is a consequence of environmental variation in our life histories depends on our genes. We know from experiments that organisms that have some sorts of genes are very sensitive to environmental variation, while other individuals with different genes are very insensitive to the same environmental variation. The point is that environmental variation and genetic variation are not independent causal pathways. Genes affect how sensitive one is to environment, and environment affects how relevant genetic differences may be. The interaction between them is inextricable, and we can only separate genetic and environmental effects statistically in a particular population of organisms at a particular moment in their history with a particular set of specified environments. When environment changes, all bets are off. The contrast between genetic and environmental, between nature and nurture, is not a contrast between fixed and changeable. It is a fallacy of biological determinism to say that if differences are in the genes, then no change can occur. We know this to be true from medical evidence alone. There are many so-called inborn errors of metabolism in which a defective gene results in normal circumstances in a defective physiology. One example is what's called Wilson's disease, a genetic defect that prevents its sufferers from detoxifying the copper that we all eat in small quantities in our ordinary food. The copper builds up in the body and eventually causes very severe nervous degeneration and finally death, sometime in adolescence or early adulthood. I have a friend, for example, three of whose children died before the age of 20 from this disease. 
Nothing could be more perfectly described as a genetic disorder. Yet people with this defective gene can now lead a perfectly normal life and have a normal development simply by taking a recently developed pill that helps them get rid of the copper. And they are then indistinguishable from anyone else. Aside from the conceptual difficulties of trying to ascribe separate effects to genes and environment, there are very severe experimental difficulties in detecting the influence of genes, especially when we deal with human beings. How do we in fact decide whether genes influence differences in some trait? In all organisms, the process is the same. We compare individuals who are differently related to one another, and if more closely related individuals are more similar than more distantly related ones, we ascribe some power to the genes. That's why we're interested in studying twins, for example. But herein lies the deep difficulty of human genetics. Unlike experimental animals, people who are more closely related to each other not only share more genes in common, but they also share environment in common because of the family and class structure of human society. The observation that children resemble their parents in some trait does not distinguish between similarity that comes from genetic similarity and similarity that arises from environmental similarity. The resemblance of parents and children is the observation, which is to be explained. It's not evidence for genes. For example, two social traits that have the highest resemblance between parents and children in North America are religious sect and political party. Yet even the most ardent biological determinist, at least the most ardent one that I've ever met, would not seriously argue that there is a gene for Episcopalianism or for voting social credit. The problem is to distinguish genetic similarity from environmental similarity. It's for this reason that so much emphasis has been put in human genetics on twin studies. The idea is that if twins are more similar than ordinary sibs, who are after all raised together in the family, or if twins raised in completely isolated families are still similar, then this surely must be evidence for genes. In particular, there's been a fascination with a study of identical twins raised apart. If identical twins, that is, twins sharing all the same genes, are similar even though they're raised apart, then their traits must be strongly influenced genetically. Much of the claim for high heritability of IQ, for example, comes from the studies of identical twins raised apart. There have really only been three major studies published. The first and largest set of studies was reported by Sir Cyril Burt back in the 1950s. This is the only set of studies that claimed no similarity of family circumstances between the families that raised the separated twins. Obviously, the similarity of family circumstances is important because we're trying to distinguish between similarity of twins that arises from their genes and similarity that arises from similar family environments. These studies also claimed a heritability of 80% for IQ. However, careful investigation by Oliver Gilly of the Times of London and Professor Leon Kamen at Princeton revealed that Bert had simply made it all up. He'd made up the numbers, he'd made up the twins. He even made up the collaborators, whose names appeared with his in the publications. We really need consider these claims no further. They represent one of the great scandals of modern psychology and biology. When we look at the other studies, which actually give details about the families that raise the separated twins, we realize that we don't, in fact, live in a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. We live in a real world. The reason that twins are separated at birth may be that their mother has died in childbirth, so that one twin is raised by an aunt and another by a best friend or a grandmother. Sometimes the parents cannot afford to keep both children, so they give one to a sister or another relative. In fact, most children raised apart are not raised apart at all. They are raised by members of the same extended family in the same small village. They went to school together. They played together. Other IQ studies on adopted children that are said to demonstrate the effect of genes have other experimental difficulties, including the failure to match children by age, or that they are extremely small samples, or that they are biased by selection of cases for study. As a consequence of such biases, there is at present simply no convincing evidence of the role of genes in influencing human behavioral variation. 
even if we could determine for certain what traits were inherited, there is a constant confusion between what is inherited and what is unchangeable. When one looks at all the studies of adoption, in order to study the genetic influence on intelligence, there are two constant results. First, children do resemble their biological parents from whom they are separated in the sense that the higher the IQ score of the biological parent, the higher the IQ score of the child who is adopted. So biological parents are having some influence on the IQ of their children, even though those children were adopted early. And putting aside the possibility of prenatal nutritional differences or extremely early stimulation, it would be reasonable to say that genes have some influence on IQ scores. But the second constant feature of such adoption studies is that the IQ test scores of those children who were adopted are about 20 points higher than those of their biological parents. It's still the case that the biological parents with the higher IQ scores had children with higher IQ scores, but the children as a group have moved well ahead of their biological parents. In fact, the average IQ scores of those children who were adopted are about equal to the average IQ scores of the adopting parents. And those adopting parents always do much better on IQ tests than the biological parents. What's all this about? It's a revelation of the actual meaning of IQ tests and of the social reality of adoption. First, what do IQ tests actually measure? They are a combination of numerical, vocabulary, educational, and attitudinal questions. They ask such things as, who was Wilkins Micawber? Or, what is the meaning of sudiferous? Or, what should a girl do if a boy hits her? Uh, hitting him back is not the right answer. And how do we know that someone who does well on such a test is intelligent? In fact, the tests were originally standardized to pick out precisely those children in a class whom the teacher had already labeled as intelligent. That is, IQ tests are instruments for giving an apparently objective and scientific basis to the social prejudices of educational institutions. After all, IQ tests are published, they are sold at very high prices. What school would buy an intelligence test that picked out the children in the class whom the teachers knew in advance were dumb? Second, people who decide on an early adoption for their children are usually working class or unemployed people who do not share in the education and culture of the middle class. People who adopt children, on the other hand, are usually middle class and have an appropriate education and cultural experience for the content and intent of IQ tests. So adopting parents as a group have a much higher IQ performance than the parents who have chosen adoption for their children. The educational and family environment in which these children are now raised has the expected result of raising all their IQs, even though there is evidence for some genetic influence of unknown origin from their biological parents. These results of adoption studies illustrate perfectly why you cannot answer a question about how much something can be changed by answering a different question, namely, are there genes influencing the trait? If we wanted seriously to ask the question posed by Arthur Jensen in his famous article, How Much Can We Boost IQ and Scholastic Achievement? The only way we could know how to answer that question would be to try to boost IQ and scholastic achievement. We do not answer it by asking, as he did, is there a genetic influence on IQ? Because to be genetic is not to be unchangeable. In a long-established set of orphanages in Britain, Dr. Bernardo's homes, where children are brought as orphans soon after birth, a study was done testing the intelligence of children of black and white ancestry. Several different tests were given at various ages. If I said nothing more about that, my guess is that most of you would assume that there were small differences with whites being better than blacks. But in fact, the reverse was true. The differences were not significant, and where there were any differences, they were in favor of blacks. There is not an iota of evidence of any kind that the differences in status, wealth, and power between races in North America have anything to do with genes, except, of course, for the genes of skin color. Indeed, there's a great deal less difference genetically in general between races than one might suppose from the superficial cues we all use in distinguishing races. Skin color, 
hair form, nose shape, are certainly influenced by genes. But we do not know how many such genes there are or how they work. On the other hand, when we look at genes we do know something about, genes that influence our blood type, for example, or genes for the various enzyme molecules essential to our physiology, what we find is that although there's a tremendous amount of variation from individual to individual, there's remarkably little variation on the average between major human groups. In fact, about 85% of all identified known human genetic variation is between any two individuals from the same ethnic group. There's another 8% of all the variation between ethnic groups within a race, say between Spaniards, Irish, Italians, Britons, and so on. And only 7% of all human genetic variation lies on the average between major human races, like the races of Africa, or Asia, or Europe, or Oceania. So, we have no reason a priori to think that there would be any genetic differentiation between racial groups with respect to characteristics like behavior, or temperament, or intelligence. Nor is there an iota of evidence that social classes, working class, middle class, owners, unemployed, differ in any way in their genes except insofar as ethnic origin or race may be used as a form of economic discrimination. The nonsense propagated by ideologues of biological determinism that the lower classes are biologically inferior to the upper classes, that all the good things in European culture come from Nordic groups, is precisely nonsense. It is meant to legitimate the structures of inequality in our society by putting on them a biological gloss and by propagating the continual confusion between what may be influenced by genes and what may be changed by social and environmental alterations. The vulgar error that confuses heritability and fixity has been, over the years, the most powerful single weapon that biological ideologues have had in legitimating a society of inequality. Since, as biologists, they must know better, one is entitled to at least a suspicion that the beneficiaries of a system of inequality are not to be regarded as objective experts. The 1990 Massey Lectures, presented by Richard C. Lewinton, continue tomorrow night on Ideas. I'm Lister Sinclair, and this is Ideas. The 1996 Massey Lectures scheduled for this week will not be heard. In their place, we present a rebroadcast of the 1990 Massey Lectures, entitled Biology as Ideology, the Doctrine of DNA, by Richard C. Lewinton. Last night, Professor Lewinton discussed the role biology has played in legitimizing a society of inequality. Over the past century, numerous studies have claimed to prove that differences in performance between the races, classes and genders are in fact natural and therefore unalterable, that they are coded in our genes and passed on from one generation to the next. At various times, studies have proved, for example, that blacks had lower intelligence than whites, that women were less suited to positions of power than men, or that the lower classes took their place at the bottom of the ladder because of their innate inferiority. In his lecture, Dr. Lewinton pointed out that there is no scientific evidence to support any of these claims. And what's more, it would be almost impossible to produce such evidence, because first, the interplay between genes and environment in human society is too complex to isolate the effects of one or the other, and second, even if there were a strong genetic component to a particular behavior, this does not mean that the behavior can't be changed or affected by the environment. But while such studies have been widely refuted, the interest in genes has increased over the years. The discovery of the structure of DNA, the stuff genes are made of, in the 1950s, and advances in microtechnology in the 70s and 80s, have given scientists newfound abilities to locate and manipulate genes. With this has come a renewed faith in genes as the cause for virtually every human trait, be it physical, mental, or social. So while in the past, 
Scientists thought genetic disorders were relatively rare. Today they're claiming that almost everything that ails humans, from high blood pressure to cancer to manic depression, is a genetic disease. Professor Lewenton is well placed to critique these claims. As an evolutionary biologist, his work has been to study the nature of genetic variation in populations and to try to understand the relationship of genes and environment. His theoretical and experimental contributions to this field have won him numerous honours. In addition to his scholarly publications, he has written two important books in the field aimed at a lay audience. Education, IQ and Class, co-authored with Michelle Schiff, and Not in Our Genes, co-authored with Stephen Rose and Leo Kamin. Tonight, Professor Lewenton turns his attention to the problems of health and disease, and he also shows how economic relations can affect the entire direction of biological research and technology. And now, Biology as Ideology, Part 3. We all think we know what we mean by cause and effect. If I slip on the ice on my way to class in winter and I break my leg, I will say that the cause of my broken leg was my fall. But one of my students will say that the real cause of my broken leg was my hurrying to class at 8 in the morning when a more reasonable teacher would have set the class for 10. A lawyer friend who hears about my fall will tell me that the cause of my fracture was the negligence of the city of Cambridge which failed to sand the streets when they were icy. And my more political friends will say that the cause of my broken leg was the unequal tax structure in Massachusetts, which starves cities of the money they need to provide basic services. One of the major prejudices of modern science, and especially of biology, is concerned with the nature of causes. Generally, one looks for the cause of an effect. Or, even if there are a number of causes allowed, one supposes that there is a major cause, and the others are only subsidiary. In any case, these causes are separated from each other, studied independently, and manipulated and interfered with in an independent way. These causes are usually seen to be at an individual level, the individual gene, or the defective organ, or an individual human being. This view of causes is nowhere more evident than in our theories of health and disease. Any textbook of medicine will tell us that the cause of tuberculosis is the tubercle bacillus, which gives us the disease when it infects us. Modern scientific medicine tells us that the reason we no longer die of infectious diseases is because of scientific medicine, with its antibiotics, chemical agents, and high-tech methods of caring for the sick, has defeated the insidious bacterium. What's the cause of cancer? The cause is the unrestricted growth of cells. And that growth, in turn, is a consequence of the failure of certain genes to regulate cell division. So, we get cancer because our genes are not doing their business. It used to be that people thought viruses were a major cause of cancer. And a great deal of money and time have been spent looking for the viral causes of cancer in humans, but without any success. Anyway, biology's moved on from the time when viruses were all the rage to a time when genes are much more trendy. On the other hand, there are the environmental insult theories of the causes of cancer. Cancers are caused, we are told, by asbestos or by PVC or by a host of natural chemicals over which we have no control. And although they are present in very low concentrations, we are exposed to them over and over again during our lives. So just as we will avoid dying from tuberculosis by dealing with the bug that causes it, so we will avoid dying from cancer by getting rid of particularly nasty chemicals in the environment. It's certainly true that one cannot get tuberculosis without a tubercle bacillus. And the evidence is quite compelling that one cannot get a cancer called mesothelioma without having ingested asbestos or some related compound. But is that the same thing as saying that the cause of tuberculosis is the tubercle bacillus and the cause of mesothelioma is asbestos? What are the consequences for our health of thinking in this way? Suppose I said that tuberculosis was a disease extremely common in the sweatshops and miserable factories of the 19th century, whereas tuberculosis rates were much lower among country people and in the upper classes. Then I might be justified in saying that the cause of tuberculosis was unregulated industrial capitalism 
And if we did away with that system of social organization, we wouldn't have to worry about the tubercle bacillus. When we look at the history of health and disease in modern European society, that explanation makes at least as good a sense as blaming the poor bacteria. What is the evidence for the successes of modern scientific medicine? Of course, we do live a lot longer than our ancestors. In 1890, the average years of life expected for a child at birth was only 45, whereas now the expected lifespan is 75 years. But that is not because modern medicine has prolonged the life of elderly and sick people. A very large fraction of the change in the average life expectancy is a tremendous reduction in the infant mortality rate. Before the turn of the century, and especially earlier in the 19th century, there was a considerable chance that a child never got to be a year old. The infant mortality rate, for example, was 13% in 1860. So the average life expectancy for the population as a whole was reduced considerably by all this early death. If you go back into an old cemetery and look at the ages of people who died in the middle of the 19th century, you'll find a remarkable number of very old people. In fact, scientific medicine has done very little to add years of life for people who have already reached their maturity. In the last 50 years, only about four months have been added to the expected lifespan of a person who's already got to be 60 years old, either in the United States or Canada. As we all know, in modern European society, women live longer than men, but they didn't used to. Before the turn of the century, women died sooner than men did. And a common explanation that's offered by scientific medicine is that an important cause of death in women in the bad old days was childbirth fever. According to this view, modern antiseptic medicine and hospital practice has been a major lifesaver for younger women during their childbearing years. But if you actually look at the statistics, childbirth fever was a minor cause of death of women during the 19th century, even women of childbearing age, and it was certainly not the cause of the excess mortality of women. Nearly all that excess mortality was a consequence of tuberculosis, probably because women had a much poorer diet than men. When tuberculosis ceased to be a major killer, women ceased to live a shorter lifespan than men did. What about the history of tuberculosis then, and all those other infectious diseases that were so terrible in the 19th century and the early part of this one? If we look at the causes of death, first systematically recorded in 1830 in Britain and a bit later in North America, what we find is that most people did indeed die of infectious disease and in particular of respiratory diseases. They died of tuberculosis. They died of diphtheria, of bronchitis, of pneumonia, and particularly among children, they died of measles and the perennial killer smallpox. As the 19th century progressed, the death rate from all of these causes decreased in a rather regular fashion. Smallpox, of course, was dealt with by a medical advance, but one that could hardly be claimed by modern scientific medicine, since smallpox vaccination was discovered in the 18th century and was already quite widespread by the early part of the 19th. The death rates from the major killers, like bronchitis, pneumonia, and tuberculosis, fell rather regularly during the 19th century with no obvious cause. There was no observable effect on the death rate after the germ theory of disease was announced in 1876 by Robert Koch. The death rate from these infectious diseases simply continued to go down as if Koch had never lived. By the time chemical therapy was introduced for tuberculosis in the earlier part of this century, more than 90% of the decrease of the death rate from that disease had already occurred. One of the most revealing cases is measles. Nowadays, Canadian and American children don't often get measles because they're vaccinated against it. But when I was a child, every school child had measles, yet no one that I know ever died of it. In the 19th century, measles was the major killer of young children, and in many African countries today, it remains the major source of mortality for children. Measles is a disease that everyone got, for which there was no known cure or medical treatment, and which simply stopped killing children in the developed countries, although they have continued to get sick. These progressive ameliorations of health were not a consequence, for example, of modern sanitation, 
because the diseases that were major killers in the 19th century were respiratory diseases and not waterborne diseases. It's unclear that simple crowding had much to do with the question, since some parts of our cities are quite as crowded as they were in the middle of the 19th century. As far as we can tell, the major decrease in death rates from the major infectious killers of the 19th century is a consequence of the general improvement in nutrition and is related simply to an increase in the real wage. In countries like Brazil today, infant mortality rises and falls with decreases and increases in the minimum wage. The immense betterment of nutrition also explains the drop in the higher rate of tuberculosis among women than among men. In the 19th century, and indeed even long into the 20th century in Britain, working men were far better nourished than their women at home. Often if meat could be afforded for the table in an urban working class family in Britain, it was saved for the man. So, there have been complex social changes resulting in increases in the real earnings of the great mass of people. This has been reflected in part in their far better nutrition. And it's these changes that really lie at the basis of our increased longevity and our decreased death rate from infectious disease. Although one may say that the tubercle bacillus causes tuberculosis, we're much closer to the truth when we say that it was the conditions of unregulated 19th century competitive capitalism, unmodulated by the demands of labor unions and of the state that was the cause of tuberculosis. But social causes are not in the ambit of biological science, so medical students continue to be taught that the cause of tuberculosis is the bacillus. In the last 20 years, precisely because of the decline in infectious disease as an important source of ill health, other single causes have been raised as the culprits in disease. It's undoubtedly true that pollutants and industrial wastes are the immediate physiological causes of cancer, of miners' black lung, of textile workers' brown lung, and a whole host of other disorders. Moreover, it's undoubtedly true that there are trace amounts of cancer-causing substances, even in the best of our food and water, unpolluted by pesticides and herbicides that make farm workers so sick. But to say that pesticides cause the death of farm workers or that cotton fibers cause brown lung and textile workers is to make a fetish out of inanimate objects. We must distinguish between agents and causes. Asbestos fibers and pesticides are the agents of disease and disability. But it is illusory to suppose that if we eliminate these particular irritants that the diseases will go away, for other similar irritants will take their place. So long as efficiency, or the maximization of profit from production, or the filling of centrally planned norms of production, without any reference to the means, remain the motivating force of productive enterprise the world over, one pollutant will replace another. So long as people are trapped by economic need, or state regulation, into production and consumption of certain kinds of things, then one poison will follow another in the productive process. Regulatory agencies or central planning departments will calculate cost-benefit ratios where human misery is somehow assigned a dollar cost. Often this is done by the number of days of work lost or the cost of medical care. But of course, none of these methods can really put a dollar cost on human misery. Asbestos and cotton lint fibers are not the causes of cancer. They are the agents of social causes, of social formations that determine the nature of our productive and consumptive lives. And in the end, it is only through changes in those social forces that we can get to the root of problems of health. The transfer of causal power from social relations into inanimate agents, which then seem to have a power and life of their own, is one of the major mystifications of science and its ideologies. Just as pollution is the most modern and up-to-date version of the external hostile forces of the physical world, so simple internal forces, the genes, are now held responsible not only for human health in its normal medical sense, but for a variety of social problems like alcoholism, criminality, drug addiction, and mental disorders. Just last month, in the pages of the New York Times, the famous Nobel Prize winner in molecular biology, James Watson, argued that we must spend vast sums of money to sequence the entire human genome. To support this claim, he said, 
We must now make a deliberate effort to surmount the next technological hurdles that keep scientists from understanding the molecular essence of other tragic and devastating illnesses like alcoholism and manic depression. Somehow, we are assured that if we could only find those genes that underlie alcoholism or the genes that have gone awry when we get cancer or become depressed, that our problems will be over. The current manifestation of this belief is the Human Genome Sequencing Project that Watson is arguing for. It's a multi-billion dollar program of North American and European biologists that is meant to take the place of space programs as the current great consumer of public monies in the interest of conquering nature. The purpose of this program is to give the complete molecular order of all the genes in the human genome. We already know a great deal about what genes are made of and how they work at the most basic level. A gene is a long string of small molecules called nucleotides. There are only four kinds of these nucleotides whose names are abbreviated by the letters A, T, C, and G. Every gene is a long string, sometimes thousands or even tens of thousands, of these A's, T's, C's, and G's in a particular order. A, A, T, C, C, G, G, C, A, T, T, and so on. This long sequence serves two functions. First, it specifies, like a code, exactly what the constitution of the protein molecules that make up our body will be. Corresponding to a particular sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's, they'll be produced by the machinery of the body, a long molecule called a protein, made up of simple elements called amino acids. If one or more nucleotides in the gene are changed, a different amino acid may be put into the protein, and the protein may not be able to carry on its physiological function as well as before. In some cases, when a different nucleotide is substituted in a gene, less or even no protein may be manufactured, because the protein manufacturing machinery of the body has a hard time recognizing the code. An example is a disease called thalassemia, which is very common in India and Pakistan and also in the Mediterranean, and from which I presume a fair number of immigrants to Canada from those regions may suffer. It's a genetic disorder that causes anemia because rather less hemoglobin is produced than normally. And the reason less hemoglobin is produced is that a change in the nucleotide sequence of the gene has made it much more difficult for the translation machinery of the body to decode the code and to make the protein. Other parts of the gene also sequences of nucleotides, form part of the machinery that turns off and turns on the production of proteins. In this way, although the same genes are in every part of the body during every part of the life of an organism, proteins corresponding to some genes will be produced at some times and in some parts of the body, whereas they will not be produced at other times and in other parts of the body. This turning on and turning off of the creation of the body's constituents is itself sensitive to external conditions. For example, if a certain kind of sugar is given to a bacterium, this sugar will signal the bacterial machinery to start making a protein that will break down the sugar and use it as a source of energy. This signal is in fact detected by part of the gene itself. So in this way, nucleotide sequences determine what kind of proteins organisms will make but they also are part of the signaling machinery that turns on and turns off the manufacture of those proteins in response to external conditions. This is the way in which the environment interacts with the genes in creating organisms. Genes have yet a further function, which is to serve as a pattern for the manufacture of further copies of themselves. When cells divide and sperm and egg cells are produced, every new cell has a complete set of genes more or less identical with the genes in the old cells. These newly manufactured genes are copied directly from the gene molecules that previously existed. Since no chemical copying process is perfect, mistakes are made. These are the so-called mutations. But these happen about one in a million copies as a rule. This machinery, as I have described it, is what we know about genes at present. And it both makes possible and has given rise to the demand for a knowledge of the complete sequence of all human genes. That is what the Human Genome Sequencing Project is all about. 
The Human Genome Sequencing Project is an ambitious plan to write down the complete nucleotide sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's for all the genes of the human being. With current technology, this is an immensely ambitious project that might take 30 years and occupy tens or even hundreds of billions of dollars. It will involve large numbers of person hours of laboratory work, huge amounts of chemicals, the invention and design of new machinery, the writing of new computer programs, and perhaps even the creation of special computers to make all the data fit together. Of course, there's always the promise that new or more efficient technology will become available to reduce the magnitude of the job. But why would one like to know the complete sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's that make up all the human genes? The claim is that if one had a reference sequence from a so-called normal individual, and one compared bits and pieces of the sequence from a person with some disorder, then the differences between the normal sequence and the sequence from the unhealthy person would tell us just where the genetic defect is that causes the disease. We could then translate the genetic code of the altered person into an altered protein to see what's wrong with the protein, and this might tell us how to treat the disease. For example, we might actually correct the molecular defect of the gene itself and implant it back into the diseased person. This is what's called gene therapy. Earlier this fall, this was in fact done for the first time with a baby that suffered from a disease that prevented it from having a normal immune system. So if diseases are caused by defective genes, and if we know what a normal gene looks like in its finest molecular detail, we would then know what to do about fixing the abnormal physiology. We would know what proteins have gone awry in cancer, and could somehow or another invent ways to fix them up. Supporters of this view would also claim that we might find particular altered proteins or missing proteins in schizophrenics or in manic depressives or in alcoholics or in drug-dependent people. And by an appropriate manipulation, we might relieve them of these terrible disabilities. Moreover, by comparing all the human genes in their molecular detail with the genes of, say, a chimpanzee or a gorilla, we would know why we're different from chimpanzees. That is, we would know what it is to be human. So what's wrong with this vision? Well, the first error it makes is in talking about the human gene sequence as if all human beings were alike. In fact, there's an immense amount of variation from normal individual to normal individual in the amino acid sequence of their proteins, because a given protein may have a variety of amino acid compositions without in the least impairing its function. Each of us carries two genes for every protein, one that we got from our mother and one we got from our father. On the average, the amino acid sequence specified by our maternally inherited and paternally inherited genes differ in about one out of every 12 genes. In addition, because of the nature of the genetic code, many changes can occur at the level of DNA which are not reflected at all in the proteins themselves. That is, there are many different DNA sequences that correspond to the same protein sequence. We do not have very good estimates for humans at the moment, but if humans are anything like experimental animals, about one in every 500 nucleotides will differ in DNA taken from any two individuals chosen at random in this audience. Since there are roughly three billion nucleotides in human genes, then any two human beings in this audience will differ on the average in about 600,000 different nucleotides. And an average gene, which is say about 3,000 nucleotides long, will differ between any two normal individuals by about 20 different nucleotides. Whose genome then is going to provide the sequence for the catalog for the normal person? Certainly not mine. Moreover, every normal person carries a very large number of defective genes in single dose inherited from one parent but not from the other, and these are covered up by a normal copy that they receive from their other normal parent. So any piece of DNA that's sequenced will have a certain number of unknown defective genes entered into the catalog. When the DNA from a person with a disease is compared to the DNA from the standard normal catalog sequence, it would be impossible to decide which of the multiple differences between the two DNAs is responsible for the disease if indeed any are. It would be necessary to look at a very large population of normal and diseased people to see if one could find some common difference between them. But even this may not happen if the disease in question has a multiple genetic cause 
so that different people have the same disease for different reasons, even if all those reasons are a consequence of genetic changes. We already know this to be the case for the human disease about which I spoke before, thalassemia. Thalassemia, remember, is a blood disorder in which less than the normal amount of hemoglobin is made. It turns out that among Asians and Europeans, there are at least 17 different defects in different parts of the hemoglobin gene, all of which have the effect of reducing the amount of hemoglobin produced. We'd look in vain for a particular nucleotide that differed between thalassemic and normal people. In the case of thalassemia, extensive population studies have revealed the correct story. But the possession of a standard normal sequence of the entire human genome was of no help and would have been no help here or in any other case. But there's another problem. The description I gave earlier of genes as determining particular proteins that an organism can manufacture, as being part of the signaling system that responds to the environment in turning on and turning off the manufacture of proteins, as being the model for the manufacture of more of themselves, differs in a subtle way from the usual description of these relations. It's usually said that genes make proteins and that genes are self-replicating. But in fact, genes can make nothing. A protein is made by a complex system of chemical production involving other proteins, using the particular sequence of nucleotides in a gene to determine the exact formula for the protein being manufactured. Sometimes the gene is said to be the blueprint for a protein or the source of information for determining a protein. As such, it's seen as more important than the mere manufacturing machinery. Yet, of course, proteins cannot be manufactured without both the gene and the rest of the machinery. Neither is more important. Isolating the gene as the so-called master molecule is another unconscious ideological commitment, one that places brains above brawn, mental work is superior to mere physical work, information is higher than action. Nor are genes self-replicating. They cannot make more of themselves any more than they can make a protein. Genes are made by a complex machinery of proteins, which uses the genes as a model for more genes. By referring to genes as self-replicating, they're endowed with a mysterious autonomous power that seems to place them above the more ordinary materials of the body. Yet if anything in the world can be said to be self-replicating, it's not the gene, but the entire organism as a complex system. The third problem of the Human Genome Sequencing Project is that it once again claims that if one knows the molecular configuration of our genes, one knows everything that's worth knowing about us. It regards the gene as determining the individual and the individual as determining society. It isolates an alteration in a so-called cancer gene as the cause of cancer, whereas that alteration in the gene may in turn have been caused by ingesting a pollutant, which in turn was produced by an industrial process, which in turn was the inevitable consequence of investing money at 6%. Once again, the impoverished notion of causation, confusing causes and agents, that characterizes modern biological ideology drives us in particular directions to find solutions for our problems. Why then do so many very powerful, famous, successful, and extremely intelligent scientists want to sequence the human genome? Obviously the answer is in part that they're so completely devoted to the ideology of simple unitary causes that they believe in the efficacy of the research and don't ask themselves more complicated questions. But in part the answer is a rather crass one. The participation in and the control of a multi-billion dollar, 30 or 50 year research project that will involve the everyday work of thousands of technicians and lower level scientists is an extraordinarily appealing prospect for an ambitious biologist. Great careers will be made, Nobel Prizes will be given, honorary degrees will be offered, important professorships and huge laboratory facilities will be put at the disposal of those who control this project and who succeed in producing thousands of computer disks of human genome sequence. Research scientists are involved in this struggle not only in their role as academics. Among molecular biologists who are professors in universities, a rather large proportion are also principal scientists or principal stockholders in biotechnology companies. Technology is a major industry and a major source of hope for profit for venture capital. The Human Genome Sequencing Project 
to the extent that it creates new technologies at public expense, will provide to biotechnology companies very powerful tools for carrying out their production of commodities for sale on the market. Moreover, the general direction of biotechnological research will be guided by the possibility of producing such commodities. If it can't make a buck off it, it won't be done. The success of the project will give greater faith in the power of biotechnology to produce useful products. Nor are biotechnologies the only producers of commodities that stand to gain immensely from the Human Genome Sequencing Project. The project will itself consume vast quantities of chemical and mechanical commodities. There are commercial machines that manufacture DNA from small amounts of sample material. There are machines that automatically sequence DNA. All of these machines require the input of a variety of chemical materials, all of which are sold at an immense profit by companies that manufacture the machines. The Human Genome Sequencing Project is big business. The billions of dollars that are to be spent on it will go in no insignificant fraction into the annual dividends of productive enterprises. The realization that there are fairly straightforward economic and status rewards awaiting those who take part in the project has given rise to a powerful opposition to the project from within biology itself, from others who are doing a different kind of science and see their own careers and their own research threatened by the diversion of money, energy, and public consciousness. Some far-sighted biologists, like the current president of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, have cautioned against the terrible public disillusionment that will follow the completion of the Human Genome Sequencing Project. The public will discover that despite the inflated claims of molecular biologists, people are still dying of cancer, of heart disease, of stroke, that institutions are still filled with schizophrenics and manic depressives, that the war against drugs has not been won. The fear among many scientists is that by promising too much, science will destroy its public image and people will become cynical as, for example, they became cynical about the war on cancer, not to speak about the war on poverty. A project of this magnitude, with so much money and prestige involved, also leads to a kind of intellectual corruption that's ordinarily thought of as the opposite of science. Recently, I've been engaged as an expert witness in criminal trials in which defendants are connected to the crime by matching bits of their DNA to DNA found at the scene of the crime. The work's currently done partly by commercial companies who make a profit only if they have a consistent record of producing positive matches for prosecutors and partly by FBI and RCMP laboratories intent on getting convictions. The actual methods are rather crude and have a high error rate. Moreover, the assumptions about the genetic composition of North American populations that are made when the chance of a purely chance match are calculated are totally unrealistic. As presently carried out, so-called DNA fingerprinting puts innocent defendants in serious jeopardy. Yet prestigious professors from important universities have appeared as expert witnesses in support of the technique, giving testimony in very general terms without offering any facts, and making assertions about human populations that have long been known to be untrue. Their motivation for this intellectual hanky-panky is, by their own testimony, because the Human Genome Sequencing Project, and indeed the entire enterprise of molecular biology, is under attack by skeptics, and that by calling into question the forensic use of these methods, we call into question the entire scientific enterprise. We see in the Genome Sequencing Project an aspect of biological science that's not often spoken of, and is perhaps the most mystified of all. That's the way in which what are said to be fundamental discoveries about the nature of life masks simple commercial relations that provide a powerful impetus for the direction and subject of research. The best documented example that we have of a purely commercial interest driving what is said to be a fundamental discovery about nature is in agriculture. Everyone has heard of hybrid corn, and it's commonly said that the invention of hybrid corn has resulted in immense increases in the productivity of agriculture and the consequent feeding of hundreds of millions of hungry people at a low cost and with great efficiency. Whereas in the 1920s, an average acre sown to maize in the corn belt of North America might yield, say, 35 bushels an acre, at present, in a decent year, one can get 125 bushels an acre. This is widely regarded as one of the greatest triumphs of basic genetics as applied to human welfare. But the truth is more interesting. 
A hybrid corn is produced by crossing two true breeding varieties of corn and taking the seed from that cross and planting it. These true breeding varieties are created by a long process of self-pollination of the corn to make each variety completely uniform genetically. A seed company will spend a certain number of years self-pollinating lines of corn until it gets uniform lines. And it will then sell to the farmer the seed that comes from crossing two of these uniform lines. The inbred homogeneous lines themselves give rather poor yields, whereas the hybrid is vastly superior in productivity. It's not the case, however, that a cross between any two inbred homogeneous lines of corn will produce a hybrid with high yield. It's necessary to search among many, many such homogeneous inbred lines to find pairs that will do the trick. The hybrid cross between the inbred lines has another quality, in addition to high yield, that's not much spoken about a quality with a unique commercial value. If a farmer has a high yielding variety of some crop, one that is resistant to disease and produces high commercial output as compared to the cost of the inputs, his normal way of carrying on his business would be to save some of the seed of this high yielding variety and to plant it next year to again achieve high yields. Once the farmer acquired the seed of this wonderful variety, he would no longer have to pay again to reacquire it because plants, like other organisms, reproduce themselves. But this fact of self-reproduction presents a very serious problem to someone who wants to make money by developing new varieties of organisms. For how will he make a profit if the moment he sold the seed, its further production is in the hands of the person who bought it? He'll get to sell it only one time, and then it will be distributed everywhere for nothing. This is the problem of copy protection. It also exists for computer software programs. The developer of computer software will be unwilling to devote time, energy, and money to developing a new program if the first customers who buy it can copy it and pass it around to their friends for virtually nothing. Plant breeders and seed producers could never make much money because farmers having bought the seed or the animal variety would in future generations produce it themselves. Of course, Seeds produced on the farm may contain a certain amount of weed seed and not be produced under the very best conditions for germination. So, in fact, farmers occasionally do go back to the seed producer for new stock. In France, for example, the average wheat farmer goes back about once every six years to replenish the supply of wheat seed. Hybrid corn is different because hybrid seed is the cross between two self-propagating homogeneous lines one cannot plant the seed of hybrid corn and get new hybrid corn. Hybrids are not true breeding. The seeds that are born on a hybrid corn plant are not themselves hybrids, but form a population of plants of varying degrees of hybridity, a mixture of homogeneous and heterogeneous varieties. A farmer who saved seed from his hybrid corn and planted it the next year would lose at least 30 bushels an acre in the next crop it's necessary for the farmer to go back every year and to buy the seed again. So the hybrid seed corn producer has found a method of copy protection. Moreover, the producer of the hybrid seed can charge the farmer a price for the hybrid seed, which is equivalent to the amount the farmer would have lost, that is the market value of about 30 bushels an acre, had he not returned to the seed company for more hybrid seed. The invention of hybrid corn was in fact a deliberate use of the principles of genetics to create a copy-protected product. We have that on the best authority possible, the statement of the inventors of hybrid corn themselves, Dr. Shull and Dr. East, who wrote that hybrids are something that might easily be taken up by the seedsman, no, not by the farmer. In fact, it's the first time in agricultural history that a seedsman is enabled to gain the full benefit from a desirable origination of his own or something that he has purchased. The man who originates a new plant, which may be of incalculable benefit to the whole country, gets nothing, not even fame, for his pains, and the plant can be propagated by anyone. The utilization of the first-generation hybrids enables the originator to keep the parental types and to give out only the crossed seeds, which are less valuable for continued propagation. The realization that the hybrid method could guarantee to the inventor immense profits has resulted in the introduction of the hybrid method into all of agriculture. Chickens, tomatoes, swine, indeed nearly every commercial plant or animal where it's possible to introduce the method,
has seen the growth of hybrids at the expense of older varietal forms. Major seed companies, like the Pioneer Hybrid Seed Company, have invested millions of dollars in attempting to produce hybrid wheat, which would then capture an immense untapped market. So far, they've not succeeded because the cost of production of the hybrid seeds is excessive. The Pioneer Hybrid Seed Company itself is the consequence of the activities of a single important political and scientific figure in the U.S., Henry Agard Wallace. Wallace's father was appointed Secretary of Agriculture by the U.S. President Warren Harding in 1920. The elder Wallace sent Henry on a tour of agricultural experiment stations, and he came back and advised his father to appoint as head of plant breeding a man who was devoted to hybrids. In the meanwhile, son Henry was himself experimenting with hybrids, and in 1924, he sold his first hybrid seed corn at a profit of about $740 an acre. In 1926, he founded the Pioneer Hybrid Seed Company, and when he, in 1932, was appointed Secretary of Agriculture by President Franklin Roosevelt, pressure for the introduction of hybrid corn in the U.S. and subsequently in Canada became irresistible. But what are we to make of this story? If hybrids really are a superior method for agricultural production, then the fact that they're also commercially useful is a side issue. The question is whether other methods of plant breeding that would not have provided property rights protection would have done just as well. The answer to that question depends on some issues in basic genetics that were undecided in the early history of hybrid corn. And up until about 30 years ago, one might have argued that the basic biology of corn production is such that only hybrids would do the trick. However, we've known the truth of the matter for the last 30 years. The fundamental experiments have been done, and no plant breeder disagrees with them. The nature of the genes responsible for influencing yield in corn are such that there was an alternative, and that alternative still exists. The alternative is one of simple, direct selection of high-yielding plants in each generation and the propagation of seed from those selected plants. By the method of selection, plant breeders could, in fact, produce varieties of corn that yield just as much as modern hybrids. The problem is that no commercial plant breeder will undertake such investigation and development because there's no money in it. One of the most interesting features of this story is the role of the agricultural experiment stations, like the state agricultural experiment stations in the U.S., or the Canada Department of Agriculture. These institutions might be expected to develop alternative methods, since they're not supposed to be concerned with profit, they're working at the public expense. Yet the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Canada Department of Agriculture are among the strongest proponents of the hybrid method. What's happened is that a purely commercial interest has so successfully clothed itself in the claims of pure science that those claims are now taught as scientific gospel. Successive generations of agricultural research workers, even those who work in public institutions, believe that hybrids are intrinsically superior, even though the experimental results that contradict this have been published in well-known journals for over 30 years. Modern agricultural biotechnology is a direct inheritance from this tradition of the commercialization of research. At the present time, molecular biologists working with DNA sequences are attempting to introduce various genes for disease resistance or climatic stress resistance into crops and domestic animals. There's a major effort to introduce nitrogen fixation into plants that ordinarily depend on nitrogen fertilizers. While every one of these changes can be seen as increasing the productivity of agriculture and reducing our dependence on chemical treatments, they're being designed in such a way as to guarantee monopoly profits to their developers. Biotechnology companies have successfully pushed for plant and animal patenting in the United States. They are pushing for it in Canada as well, although so far they haven't succeeded. Moreover, seed are developed which cannot be self-reproduced by the farmer or which must be specially treated with a chemical coating in factories before they will successfully germinate and grow into adult plants. Every development must be of the kind that will keep farmers from liberating themselves from the suppliers of these commodities. Once again, what appears to us in the mystical guise of pure science and of objective knowledge about nature 
turns out underneath to be political, economic, and social ideology. The 1990 Massey Lectures, presented by Richard C. Lewinton, continue tomorrow night on Ideas. I'm Lister Sinclair, and this is Ideas. The 1996 Massey Lectures scheduled for this week will not be heard. In their place, we present a rebroadcast of the 1990 Massey Lectures, entitled Biology as Ideology, The Doctrine of DNA, by Richard C. Lewinton. Last night, Professor Lewinton focused on the role of genes in contemporary medical research. He claimed that because of its reductionist approach to research, science has tried to reduce complex phenomena to simple causes. These days, the favoured cause has been the gene. Genes are now thought to be the cause for almost every human trait, be it physical or mental. So while in the past, scientists thought genetic disorders were relatively rare, today they claim that almost everything that ails humans, from high blood pressure to cancer to alcoholism, has a genetic cause. And since the mid-1970s, a new discipline called sociobiology has gone one step further. It's attempted to locate the cause for social phenomena in the gene as well. Social biologists claim, for example, that societies are naturally competitive, aggressive, hierarchical and individualistic because individuals are naturally competitive, aggressive, hierarchical and individualistic, that these traits are coded in our genes. Professor Lewinton's work as an evolutionary biologist has led him to dispute these claims. He believes that rather than being based on science, they are ideologically driven. Tonight, Professor Lewinton continues with part four of Biology as Ideology, the Doctrine of DNA. The claim that all of human existence is controlled by our DNA is a popular one. This has the effect of legitimizing the structures of society in which we live, because it does not stop with the assertion that differences in temperament, ability, physical and mental health between us are coded in our genes. It also goes on to say that the political structures of society itself, the competitive, entrepreneurial, hierarchical society in which we live, and which deferentially rewards different temperaments, different cognitive abilities, different mental attitudes, that that social structure is also determined by our DNA, and that it is therefore unchangeable. For after all, even if we were biologically different from one another, that in itself would not guarantee that society would give different power and status to people who are different. To make the ideology of legitimacy complete, we have to have a theory of unchangeable human nature, a human nature that's coded in our genes. Every political philosophy has to begin with a theory of human nature. Surely, if we cannot say what it is to be truly human, we cannot argue for one or another form of social organization. Social revolutionaries, especially, must have a notion of what it is to be truly human, because the call for revolution is the call for the spilling of blood and for a wholesale reorganization of the world. One can hardly call for a violent overthrow of what is without claiming that what will be is more in accord with the true nature of human existence. So, even Karl Marx, whose whole view of society was an historical one, nevertheless believed that there was a true human nature and that human beings realize themselves in their essence by a planned social manipulation of nature for human welfare. The problem for political philosophers has always been to try to justify their particular view of human nature. Before the 17th century, the appeal was made to divine wisdom. God had made people in a certain way. Indeed, they were made in God's image, although perhaps a blurred one, and moreover, human beings were basically sinful from the time of Adam and Eve's fall. But modern secular technological society cannot draw its political claims from divine justification. From the 17th century onward, political philosophers have tried to create a picture of human nature based on some sort of appeal to a naturalistic view of the world. Thomas Hobbes, in his Leviathan, 
which argued for the necessity of the king, built a picture of human nature from the simplest axioms about the nature of human beings as organisms. To Hobbes, in the 17th century, human beings, like other animals, were self-enlarging, self-aggrandizing objects that simply had to grow and occupy the world. But the world was a place of finite resources, and so it necessarily would happen that human beings would come into conflict over those resources as they expanded, and the result would be what he called the war of all against all. The conclusion for Hobbes was that one needed a king to prevent this war from destroying everything. The claim that organisms, especially human beings, grow without bound, and that the world in which they grow is finite and limited, are the two basic claims that have given rise to the modern biological theory of human nature. They resurfaced again in the Reverend Malthus' treatment on population and his famous law that organisms grow geometrically in numbers while the resources for their subsistence only grow arithmetically. So again, a struggle for existence must occur. As we all know, Darwin took over this notion of nature to build his theory of natural selection. Since all organisms are engaged in a struggle for existence, those that are better suited by their shape and form, by their physiology, by their behavior, to leave more offspring in that struggle and to survive will do so. And the consequence will be that their kind will take over the world. The Darwinian view is that whatever human nature may be, it, like everything else about humans, who are after all living organisms, has evolved by natural selection. Therefore, what we truly are is the result of two billion years of evolution from the earliest rudimentary organism up to us. As evolutionary theory has developed over the last 100 years and become technologically and scientifically sophisticated, as vague notions of inheritance have become converted into a very precise theory of the structure and function of DNA, so the evolutionary view of human nature has developed a modern, very scientific-sounding apparatus that makes it seem every bit as unchallengeable as the theories of divine providence seemed in an earlier age. What has happened in effect is that Thomas Hobbes' war of all against all has been converted into a struggle between DNA molecules for supremacy and dominance over the structure of human life. The most modern form of naturalistic human nature ideology is called sociobiology. It emerged onto the public scene a little over 15 years ago and has since become the ruling theory for justifying the permanence of society as we know it. It's an evolutionary theory and it's a genetic theory using the entire theoretical apparatus of modern evolutionary biology, including a great deal of abstruse mathematics, which is then translated for the inexpert reader in coffee table books with beguiling pictures and in magazine articles and newspaper accounts. Sociobiology is the latest and most mystified attempt to convince people that human life is pretty much what it has to be and perhaps even what it ought to be. The sociobiological theory of human nature is built in three steps. The first is an actual description of what human nature is like. One looks around at human beings and tries to build a fairly complete description of the features that are said to be common to all human beings, in all societies, in all places, and at all times. The second step in this naturalistic evolutionary theory of human nature is to claim that those characteristics which appear to be universal in humans are in fact coded in their genes, that is, in their DNA. We need for this purpose genes for religiosity, genes for entrepreneurship, genes for whatever characteristics are said to be built into the human psyche and human social organization. These two claims, that there is a universal human nature and that it is coded in the genes and is unchangeable, would, I suppose, be sufficient as a biological theory of human nature in a purely descriptive sense. This is what we are, take it or leave it. But sociobiological theory, being built on evolutionary theory, goes one step further, as it must to fulfill its program. It has to explain, and in some sense justify, how we got to have these particular genes, rather than some other genes that might have given us quite a different human nature. We then have the third step, 
which is to claim that natural selection, through the differential survival and reproduction of different kinds of organisms, has led inevitably to the particular genetic characteristics that we have and that are said to form society. This claim strengthens the argument of legitimacy because it says that not only are we a certain way, but there's no other way we could have been, given the universal law of the struggle for existence and the survival of the fittest. In this sense, the sociobiological theory of human nature puts on a mantle of universality and of utter fixity. After all, if two billion years of evolution have made us what we are, do you really think that a hundred days of revolution will change us? So how do sociobiologists go about taking the first step, the claimed correct description of what is universal in all human beings? They do it more or less as every human nature theorist has done it, by looking around to see what people around them are like, and to some extent by telling their own life histories. Having looked inward at themselves and outward at modern capitalist society for a description of human nature, they then extend it a bit further by looking into the anthropological record in order to assure us that those very same elements that they find in the 20th century American and British societies are also in one form or another displayed by the Stone Age people of New Guinea. For some reason, they do not look much at the historical record of European society, of which they seem to be quite ignorant. Uh, but perhaps they feel that if New Guinea Highlanders and Scottish Highlanders show the same characteristics today, then there can't have been much change in the last 1,500 years of recorded history. And what are these human universals that sociobiologists find? Well, one can hardly do better than look at the most influential and, in some sense, founding document of sociobiological theory, a book by my colleague at Harvard, Professor E.O. Wilson, called Sociobiology the new synthesis. Professor Wilson tells us, for example, that human beings are indoctrinable. He says, human beings are absurdly easy to indoctrinate. They seek it. They're also characterized by blind faith. Men would rather believe than know. The statement that men would rather believe than know is, we must note, found in what is called a scientific work, used as a textbook in courses all over the world filled with the mathematics of modern population biology, crammed with observations and facts about the behavior of all kinds of animals, based on what Time magazine has called the iron laws of nature. But surely, men would rather believe than know, is more in the line of barroom wisdom. You know, I go to the pub and I turn to my friend and I say, well, you know, men would rather believe than know. Among other aspects of human nature are said to be universal spite and family chauvinism. We're told that human beings are keenly aware of their own bloodlines and have the intelligence to plot intrigue. Xenophobia, the fear of strangers, is supposed to be part of our universal equipment. According to Professor Wilson, part of man's problem is that his intergroup responses are still crude and primitive and inadequate for the extending territorial relationship that civilization has thrust upon him. One of the results of this is genocide and warfare. So, we're told that the most distinctive human qualities have emerged during the phase of social evolution that occurred through intertribal warfare and through genocide. And then, of course, there's a relationship between the sexes. Male dominance and superiority is part of human nature. So Wilson writes that among general social traits in human beings are aggressive dominance systems with males dominant over females. This list I've given is not complete, nor is this simply the idiosyncratic view of one influential sociobiologist. The claims that human warfare, sexual dominance, love of private property, hate of strangers are all human universals are found over and over again in the writings of sociobiologists, whether they be themselves biologists, economists, psychologists, or political scientists. But in order to make such claims, one must be quite blind even to the history of European society. Take, for example, the claim of a universal xenophobia. In fact, the attitudes of people toward foreign cultures and other countries has been one which has varied tremendously from social class to social class and from time to time. 
Could the aristocracy of Russia in the 19th century, which thought all things Slavic to be inferior, which spoke French by preference, which looked to Germany for its military and technological resources, could that be described as xenophobic? Educated and upper classes in particular have often looked to other cultures for the highest and the best. I'm occasionally interviewed by Italian radio and television, and the answers I give to their questions about science are then translated into Italian, which the listeners hear in a voiceover after a few moments of my English. When I ask the producers why they don't simply get an Italian scientist to do the program, they tell me that Italians simply don't believe any claims about science that are made in Italian, and that they have to hear it in English if they're going to believe it's true. Nothing better reveals the narrow ahistorical claims of sociobiological description than the standard discussion of the economy of scarcity and unequal distribution by political scientists and economists when they are arguing in the sociobiological mode. Professor Wilson said that the members of human societies sometimes cooperate closely in insectin fashion. Note the word insectin. But more frequently, they compete for the limited resources allocated to their role sector. The best and the most entrepreneurial of the role actors usually gain a disproportionate share of the rewards, while the least successful are displaced to other less desirable positions. But this description completely ignores the immense amount of sharing of resources that occurs among a whole variety of modern hunting and gathering societies like Eskimos. And it certainly completely distorts the history even of Europe. The concept of entrepreneurship does not work for, say, uh, the 13th century in the Ile de France, which was an agrarian, feudal society in which land could not be bought and sold, in which labor could not be hired and fired, and in which the so-called market mechanism was only a rudimentary form of exchange of a few goods. Of course, sociobiologists recognize that there are exceptions to these generalizations, but their claim is that these exceptions are temporary and unnatural and that they will not persist in the absence of constant force and threat. So societies may indeed, like blue-clad, regimented Chinese, cooperate in insectin fashion. But this can only be managed by constant supervision and force. The moment one relaxes one's vigil, people will revert to their natural ways. It's rather as if we could make a law saying that everyone would have to walk on their knees, which would be physically possible but terribly painful. The moment we relaxed our vigil, everybody would stand upright again. At the surface of this theory of human nature is the obvious ideological commitment to modern, entrepreneurial, competitive, hierarchical society. But underneath is a deeper ideology, and that is the priority of the individual over the collective. Despite the name sociobiology, we are not dealing with a theory of social causation, but of individual causation. The characteristics of society are seen as caused by the individual properties that its members have. And those properties, as we shall see, are said to derive from their genes. If human societies engage in war, that's supposed to be because each individual in society is aggressive. If men as a group dominate women, or whites dominate blacks, it's because each man, as an individual, is supposed to be desirous of dominating each woman, and every white person must have feelings of personal hostility set off by the sight of a black skin. The structures of society simply reflect these individual predispositions in the sociobiological view. Society is nothing but the collection of individuals in it, just as culture is seen as nothing but the collection of disarticulated bits and pieces, individual preferences and habits. But such a view completely confuses, partly by linguistic confusion, very different phenomena. Look, it's obviously not the case that Britain and Germany made war on each other in 1914 because individual Britons and individual Germans felt aggressive. If that were the case, we would not have to have had conscription. English, Canadians, American soldiers killed Germans and vice versa because the state put them in a position that made that inevitable. A refusal to be conscripted meant a jail term, and the refusal to obey orders in the field meant death before a firing squad. Great machines of propaganda, martial music, stories of atrocities are manufactured by the state 
in order to convince its citizens that their lives and the chastity of their daughters are at risk in the face of the threat by barbarians. The confusion between individual aggression and national aggression is a confusion between the rush of hormones that I might feel if the producer of this program walked up to me and slapped me in the face, and a national political agenda that's meant to control natural resources, lines of commerce, prices of agricultural goods, and the availability of labor forces that are really the origins of warfare between states. It's important to realize that one doesn't have to have a particular view of the content of human nature to make this error of individuals causing society. Prince Pyotr Kropotkin, a famous anarchist and indeed the founder of modern anarchism, also claimed that there was universal human nature, but that that human nature was one that would create cooperation and would be anti-hierarchical if only it were allowed free play against the dominance and oppressiveness of the state. But his theory was no less a theory of the dominance of the individual as a source of the social than is the modern sociobiological theory. Having once described a universal set of human social institutions that are said to be the consequence of individual natures, sociobiological theory then goes on to claim that those individual properties are coded in our genes. There are said to be genes for entrepreneurship, for male dominance, for aggressivity. So conflict between the sexes or between parents and offspring are said to be genetically programmed. What's the evidence that those claimed human universals are in fact in our genes? Well, often it's simply asserted that because they're universal, they must be genetic. A classic example is in the discussion of sexual dominance. Professor Wilson has written in the New York Times, in hunter-gatherer societies, men hunt and women stay at home. This strong bias persists in most agricultural and industrial societies. Apparently, the professor is not caught up with women in the workforce yet. And on that ground alone appears to have genetic origin, he says. This argument confuses the observation with its explanation. If the circularity is not obvious to you, you might consider the claim that since 99% of Finns are Lutherans, they must have a gene for it. A second evidence offered for the genetic determination of human universal traits is the claim that other animals show the same traits and that therefore we must have a genetic continuity with them, since we descended from animal-like ancestors in evolution. Ants are described as making slaves and having queens. But the slavery of ants knows nothing about the auction block, about whips and overseers of buying and selling, of the essentially commodity nature of the slave relationships in human societies. Indeed, ant slaves are almost always of other species, and ant slavery has a great deal more in common with the domestication of animals than it does with slavery. Nor do ants have queens. The force-fed egg factory encased in a special chamber in the middle of an ant colony that's called a queen has no resemblance to the life of either Elizabeth I nor Elizabeth II nor of their different political roles in society. This confusion between qualities of animals and qualities of human society is an example of the problem in biology of homology and analogy. By homologous traits, biologists mean those properties of organisms which in fact are shared by different species because they have a common biological origin and evolution and some common biological genetic ancestry, and that they derive from common features of anatomy. Even though they look very different and are used for very different purposes, for example, the bones of a human arm and of a bat's wing are homologous because they're anatomically derived from the same structures and influenced by the same genes. On the other hand, a bat's wing and an insect's wing are only analogous. That is, they look superficially alike and they seem to serve the same function, but they have no origin in common at the genetic or morphological or evolutionary level. But of course, analogy is in the eye of the observer. How do we decide that slavery in ants and ant queens are like human slavery and like human royal families? How do we decide that the coyness we see in people is the same as the behavior in animals that sociobiologists call coyness? What happens, in fact, is that human categories are laid on animals by analogy, and then suddenly these traits are discovered in animals 
and laid back on humans as if they had a common origin. When human beings look at animals, indeed when human beings look at any aspect of the world, they search in human experience, and especially human social experience, not only for the words that they use, but for the concepts themselves. How else can human beings see ant society except as human society writ small? There is, in fact, not a shred of evidence that the anatomical, physiological, and genetical basis of what's called aggression in rats has anything at all in common with the German invasion of Poland in 1938. The third set of evidence that's presented for the genetic basis of human social behavior is the report of heritability of human traits. So, such characteristics as introversion and extroversion, personal tempo, psychomotor and sports activities, eroticism, dominance, depression, and even conservatism and liberalism are said to be heritable. But the evidence for the heritability of these traits is totally absent. We must remember that genetics is a study of similarity and difference between relatives. We judge things to be heritable if close relatives are more alike than our distant relatives or unrelated persons. But the problem in human genetics, in particular, is that similarity between relatives arises not only for biological reasons, but for cultural reasons as well, since members of the same family share the same environment in nuclear families. This has always been the problem of human genetics whether we are talking about traits of personality or even of anatomy. Most reports of the heritability of personality traits are in fact simple observations that parents and children resemble each other in some respect. We must remember that the highest similarity between parents and offspring for social traits in North America is for political party and religious sect. Yet no serious person believes in genes for Anglicanism or voting NDP. The observation of similarity of parents and offspring is not an evidence of their biological similarity. There's a confusion here between the observation and the possible causal explanations. The fact is, not a single study of personality traits in human populations has successfully disentangled similarity because of shared family experience from similarity because of genes. So, in fact, we know nothing about the heritability of human temperamental and intellectual traits that are supposed to be the basis for social organization. But there's even a deeper problem. In order to carry out a heritability study, even a correct one, we require differences between individuals. All of genetics is a study of differences. If everyone were identical in some respect, that is, if everybody had exactly the same genes for some characteristic, then there would be no way to investigate its heritability because genetic investigations require contrast between individuals. Sociobiological theory claims that all human beings share genes, the same genes, for aggression, for xenophobia, for male dominance, and so on. But if we all share these genes, if evolution has made us all alike in this genetically determined human nature, then in principle there'd be no way to investigate the heritability of the traits. On the other hand, if there's genetic variation among human beings in these respects, then on what basis do we declare that one or another manifestation is universal human nature? If it's genetically determined that we're aggressive and like to go to war, then we have to suppose that A.J. Musty, the famous pacifist who spent a good part of his adult life in prison, lacked this gene and was therefore in some sense less than human. If, on the other hand, he possessed the gene but was a pacifist anyway, the genes seem somewhat less than all-powerful in determining behavior. Why aren't we all like A.J. Musty? There are deep contradictions in the simultaneous assertion that we're all genetically alike in certain respects and that our genes are all powerful in determining our behavior and at the same time observing that people differ. Finally, there's an extraordinary naivete and ignorance of the principles of developmental biology involved in assertions that genes make us behave in particular ways in particular circumstances. DNA functions in several ways in influencing the development of organisms. First, the exact sequence of the amino acids in our proteins is coded in our genes, but no one would suggest that the amino acid sequence for a particular protein in itself can make us liberal or conservative. Second, genes influence when in the course of development and in which part of the body particular proteins are to be produced, and this in turn influences cell division and cell growth. 
So it might be claimed that there's a fixed pattern of neurons in our central nervous system, influenced by the turning on and turning off of genes during development, that makes us warlike or pacifist. But this would require a theory of the development of the central nervous system that makes no allowances for developmental accidents and little or no role for the creation of mental structures by experience. Yet even the rudimentary social organization of ants, with their structure of work and inter-individual relations, that is so simple as compared with ours, is very flexible with respect to information from the external world. Even ant colonies change their collective social behavior over time, and depending on how long the colony has occupied a given territory. It takes an enormous set of assumptions to suppose that this human central nervous system, with thousands of times more nervous connections than in any ant, has completely stereotyped and fixed genetic responses to circumstances. The incredible variety of human social circumstances would require an amount of DNA that we simply don't possess. There's enough human DNA to make about 250,000 genes, but that would simply be insufficient to determine the incredible complexity of human social organization, except in its most general outlines. Once we admit that these outlines are only general, however, then we have to allow immense flexibility depending on particular circumstances. The final step in the sociobiological argument is to say that the genes we possess for universal human nature have been established in us through evolution by natural selection. That is, once upon a time, human beings varied genetically in the degree to which they were aggressive, xenophobic, indoctrinable, male-dominated, and so on. But those individuals who were most aggressive or most male-dominant left more offspring. So the genes that were eventually left in us as a species were the ones that now determine these traits. The argument of natural selection seems a fairly simple and straightforward one for some kinds of traits. For example, it's argued, the more aggressive of our ancestors would leave more offspring because they would swoop down on the less aggressive ones and eliminate them. The more entrepreneurial ones would have grabbed more resources and starved out the wimps. In each case, it's easy to make up a plausible story that would explain the superior reproductive abilities of one type over another. Oh, but then there are some traits that are said to be universal and don't lend themselves so easily to this story of individual reproductive advantage. One example, and it's one that's discussed a great deal by sociobiologists and regarded by them as the triumph of sociobiological reasoning, is the problem of altruistic behavior. Why should we be cooperative under some circumstances? Why should we sometimes give up what appear to be immediate advantages, even reproductive advantages, for the benefit of others? To explain this, sociobiologists discuss the theory of kin selection. In order for us to pass genes to future generations and so have them increase in evolution, it's not necessary for us as individuals to pass on our own genes, provided that our brothers and sisters, who share half of our genes because of common ancestry, could pass on their genes to future generations. So if we could behave in a cooperative or even altruistic way, that would increase the number of offspring that our brothers and sisters would have, we could afford to give up our own reproduction and even our own survivorship. My kinds of genes would increase indirectly through the increase of genes of my relatives. In this indirect way, I would be leaving more offspring. This is the phenomenon of what ornithologists call helpers at the nest in birds, in which it is said that non-reproductive birds help out their close relatives, who are then able to raise more than the ordinary number of offspring, and in the end, more family genes are left. To make this work, if you give up your own reproduction, your brothers and sisters have to have twice as many offspring as ordinarily, but one can at least tell a story that might make this plausible. But that's not enough. What about those traits that don't even benefit our relatives differentially? For example, a general altruism toward all members of our species. Why are we good to strangers? For this, the sociobiologist provides the theory of so-called reciprocal altruism. The argument is that even if we're unrelated, if I do you a favor that costs me something, you'll remember that favor and you'll reciprocate in the future. And by this completely indirect path, I'll succeed in advancing my own reproduction. 
An example often given is that of the drowning person. I see someone drowning. I jump in to save that person even at the risk of my own life. But in the future, when I'm drowning, that person will remember and will save me. And by this indirect path, I'll increase my own probability of survival and reproduction over the long run. Uh, the problem with this story is, of course, that the last person in the world I want to depend on to save me when I'm drowning is someone whom I had to save in the past, since he or she is not likely to be a very strong swimmer. The real difficulty with this process of explanation is that one can make up a story that will explain the natural selective advantage of any trait that one sees. Combining individual selective advantage with the possibility of kin selection and with reciprocal altruism, it's hard to imagine any human trait for which I could not invent a plausible scenario for its selective advantage. The real problem is, how do we find out whether any of these stories is true? We must distinguish between plausible stories, things that might be true, and true stories, things that have actually happened. How do we know that human altruism arose because of kin selection? or reciprocal altruistic selection. At the very minimum, we might ask whether there's any evidence that such selective processes are going on at the present. But in fact, no one's ever asked that question. No one has ever measured in any human population the actual reproductive advantage or disadvantage of any human behavior. All of the sociobiological explanations of the evolution of human behavior are like Rudyard Kipling's Just So stories of how the camel got his hump and how the elephant got his trunk. They are just stories. Science has been turned into a game, and anyone can play it. Let me illustrate the entire process by two cases. One is meant only fancifully by sociobiologists as a teaching exercise, but one they take very seriously. The fanciful one concerns the problem of why children hate spinach and why adults like it. I didn't make this case up out of my head, it's contained in a high school textbook written by a sociobiologist in order to train children in this kind of thinking. Why do children hate spinach? Well, first, we have the question of description. Is it really true that children hate spinach? Of course it's true. The students only have to look around them and ask their friends. Moreover, when we look around, we find that adults eat spinach. How has this happened? First, let's imagine that there's a gene that has the property that it causes children to hate spinach, but allows adults to like it. Note, there's no evidence for such a gene. We simply suppose there is one. Now, it is a fact that spinach contains a substance called oxalic acid that interferes with the absorption of calcium, which young children do indeed need for their growing bones. So, any child in the past who had the wrong gene and who ate spinach would have had defective growth, would have got rickets, and might not have lived or left many offspring. On the other hand, adults' bones have stopped growing, so calcium is not so important to them, and they're free to take advantage of the nutrients in spinach, and so there's no selection against their liking it. As a consequence, the story goes, it's a part of genetically determined human nature that children have come to hate spinach and adults have come to like it. We have here a completely articulated story of a claimed universal fact of human nature. We should not let the silliness of this case distract us from its essential features. It's meant to teach students all the elements of a naturalistic argument about human nature. It makes a generalized observation by looking around. It postulates genes without any evidence, and then it tells a plausible, or perhaps not so plausible, story. Let's see how this is applied to a serious case, and one that's widely discussed by sociobiologists, namely the existence in human societies of homosexuality. Homosexuality is claimed to be a biological problem by sociobiologists because, after all, since homosexuals leave no offspring, the genes for homosexuality should have long ago disappeared. Why haven't they? First, the sociobiologist makes the assumption that homosexuals leave fewer offspring. This implies a description of human sexual behavior in which the world is divided neatly between heterosexuals and homosexuals one class of which leaves all the children and the other class leaving none. This, however, does not happen to correspond to our knowledge about human sexuality. In fact, the world is not divided between two classes of sexual behavior. On the contrary, there is a continuum of sexuality from persons who have never engaged in anything but heterosexual behavior through those who have a somewhat wider range of experiences, 
to those who are regularly bisexual to those who are in fact totally homosexual. If we're to believe a number of surveys, about half of all the males in North America have had at least one homosexual contact. Moreover, the range of sexual behaviors in males and females has varied historically by social class. There was widespread bisexuality among males in the upper classes in classical Roman Greece. And indeed, what were the usual homosexual practices then were very different from present practices. Curiously enough, there's not an iota of evidence about the relative reproductive rates of people who are totally heterosexual as opposed to those who have a broader range of sexual experience. So, for example, we don't know whether a person who's heterosexual in, say, 40% of his or her encounters and homosexual in, say, 60% has fewer or more children than people who are totally heterosexual. Indeed, I could make an argument that bisexuality simply is a manifestation of greater general libido, and it might turn out that bisexual people leave more offspring. We simply don't know the answer because no one has ever tried to find out. Second, what's the evidence that there are any genetic differences between individuals according to their sexual preference? Absolutely none. If it were really true, by the way, that homosexuals left no offspring, then there might be a certain problem in studying the heritability of homosexual behavior. Of course, no one has ever tried to do this. So the claims for genetic predisposition to different forms of sexuality are pure fancy. Finally, we have the problem of the evolutionary story. The one told by sociobiologists is the story of helpers at the nest. According to them, homosexuals in the past did not themselves leave any offspring, but they helped their heterosexual brothers and sisters to raise more children by sharing resources with them. And this compensation was more than sufficient to keep the genes for homosexuality in the population. We must remember that they must help their brothers and sisters so well that those relatives would have twice as many offspring as usual. What's the evidence for helpers at the nest in human societies? You won't be surprised to find that there isn't any. Certainly not for our remote prehistoric ancestors, who are after all prehistoric. And if those ancestors are anything like modern hunting and gathering people, a general sharing of resources is a very common phenomenon, not only within the family, but within the entire village, and does not require helpers at the nest. But irrespective of any evidence about the past, what do we know about the relative number of offspring left by people at present who have homosexual brothers and sisters? Nothing. There is no evidence. No one has ever actually measured family size in relation to this question. Thus, the entire discussion of the evolutionary basis of human sexual preference is a made-up story from beginning to end. Yet, it's a story that appears in textbooks, in courses in universities and high schools, on questions of biology and human nature, and in popular books, journals, television, and radio programs. It bears the legitimacy given to it by famous professors and by national and international media. It has the authority of science. Critics of sociobiology might say that it's bad science because there are no facts and only fanciful stories. But in an important sense, sociobiology is science because science consists not simply of a collection of true facts about the world, but is a collection of assertions and theories made by people who call themselves scientists. It consists in large part of what scientists say about the world, whatever the true state of the world might be. Science is not simply an institution devoted to the manipulation of the physical world. It also has as a function the formation of people's consciousness about the political and social world. Science in that sense is part of the general sphere of education, and the assertions of scientists are the basis for a great deal of the educational enterprise, the enterprise of forming people's consciousness. Education in general, and scientific education in particular, is meant not only to make us competent to manipulate the world, but it is meant to help form our social attitudes. No one saw this more clearly and was more open and honest about it than one of the most conservative political figures in American history, Daniel Webster, who said, education is a wise and liberal form of police by which property and life and the peace of society are secured. The 1990 Massey Lectures, presented by Richard C. Lewinton, 
conclude tomorrow night on ideas. I'm Lister Sinclair, and this is Ideas. The 1996 Massey Lectures scheduled for this week will not be heard. In their place, we present a rebroadcast of the 1990 Massey Lectures, entitled Biology as Ideology, The Doctrine of DNA, by Richard C. Lewinton. The Massey Lectures have been an annual event on CBC Radio for the past 29 years, they're commissioned to present CBC listeners with the work of leading figures in the humanities, the arts, politics, and the physical and social sciences. The 1990 Massey Lectures are presented by Richard C. Lewinton, distinguished evolutionary biologist, and Alexander Agassiz, professor of zoology at Harvard University. Professor Lewinton's chief scientific work has been to study the nature of genetic variation in populations, and his experimental and theoretical contributions in this field have brought him many awards and honors. But as well as being a practicing scientist, Professor Lewinton has had a long-standing commitment to social change, and he has succeeded in wedding his two passions throughout his career. In the 1960s, he was one of the few scientists to speak out against the Vietnam War. He was a founding member of Science for the People, an international organization aimed at promoting a science that is answerable to the majority of people rather than being at the service of a few. He created quite an uproar when he resigned from the prestigious National Academy of Sciences over the issue of secret war research and in protest against the existence of such an elite organization. He is also on the board of directors of the Council on Responsible Genetics, which monitors and critiques the uses to which modern genetic research is put. In addition to numerous scholarly publications, Dr. Lewinton has authored or co-authored a number of popular books on biology, including Human Diversity, a Scientific American publication, Education, IQ and Class, co-authored with Michelle Schiff, and Not in Our Genes, co-authored with Stephen Rose and Leo Kamen. In his work to demystify science, Professor Lewinton continually exposes the ways in which science interacts with society. In tonight's lecture, he challenges Darwin's adaptionist view of evolution and examines the implications for the environmental movement. And now, Biology as Ideology, Part 5. In the previous lectures in this series, I've been concerned with a particular ideological bias of modern biology. That bias is that everything that we are, our sickness and health, our poverty and wealth, and the very structure of the society in which we live, is ultimately encoded in our DNA. We are, in uh, the words of Richard Dawkins, the Oxford zoologist, lumbering robots controlled by our DNA, body and mind. But the view that we're at the mercy of internal forces present within ourselves from birth, is part of a deep ideological commitment that goes under the name of reductionism. By reductionism, we mean the belief that the world is broken up into tiny bits and pieces, each of which has its own properties and which combine together to make larger things. The individual makes society, for example, and society is nothing but the manifestation of the properties of individual human beings. Individual internal properties are the causes of things, and the properties of the social whole are the effects of those causes. This individualistic view of the biological world is simply a reflection of the ideologies of the bourgeois revolutions of the 18th century that placed the individual at the center of everything. This view about causes and effects, and autonomy of individual bits and pieces, results not only in a belief that internal forces beyond our control govern what we are as individual people, it also sees an outside world with its own bits and pieces, its own laws, which we as individuals may confront, but we cannot in fact influence. Just as the genes are totally inside of us, so the environment is totally outside of us, and we as actors are at the mercy of both these internal and external worlds. 
This gives rise to the false dichotomy of nature and nurture. Against those who say that our ability to solve problems, our intelligence, is determined by our genes, there exists a contrary party that says, no, our intelligence is determined by our environment. And so the struggle goes on between those who believe in the primacy of nature and those who believe in the primacy of nurture. The separation between nature and nurture, between the organism and the environment, really goes back to Charles Darwin, who finally brought biology into the modern mechanistic worldview. Before Darwin, it was the view that what was outside and what was inside were part of the same whole system, and one could influence the other. The most famous theory of evolution before Darwin was that of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who believed in the inheritance of acquired characteristics. That is to say, changes occurred in the environment, which in turn caused changes in the body or the behavior of organisms, and these changes, which were induced by the environment, would enter into the hereditary structure of the organisms and would be passed on to the next generation. The story that everyone knows is the giraffe that stretches its neck to eat the leaves on the highest trees. Its offspring then have slightly longer necks. These are then passed on to the next generation, which again stretch their necks until finally we have giraffes of great long necks. In this view, there's nothing that really separated what was outside from what was inside because external alterations, the stretching of the neck, would enter into the organism and be perpetuated into future generations. Darwin completely rejected this worldview and replaced it by one in which organisms and environment were totally separated. The external world had its own laws, its own methods of operation, and organisms confronted these and experienced them and either successfully adapted to them or failed. It's the notion that you can't fight City Hall, adapt or die. Those organisms whose properties enable them to cope with the problems set by the external world would survive and leave offspring, and the others would fail to do so and leave no trace. So the species would change, not because the environment directly caused physical changes in the organism, but because those organisms smart enough or better built enough to be able to handle the problems thrown at them by nature would leave more offspring who would resemble them. The deep point of Darwinism was the separation between the forces of the environment that created the problems and the internal forces of the organisms that threw up the solutions to the problems more or less at random. The correct solutions were the ones that were preserved. The external and internal forces of the world were behaving in their own independent ways. The only connection between them was a passive one. The organisms who happened to be lucky enough to find a match between what was going on inside of themselves and what was going on outside of themselves survived. Darwin's view was really essential to our successful unraveling of evolution because Lamarck was simply wrong about the way in which the environment influences heredity. And Darwin's alienation of the organism from the environment was an essential first step in a correct description of the way in which the forces of nature act on each other. The problem is that it was only a first step and we have become frozen there. Modern biology has become completely committed to the view that organisms are nothing but the battlegrounds between the outside forces and the inside forces. Organisms are the passive consequences of external and internal activities outside their control. As I've said, this view has important political reverberations. It says that the world is really outside our control, that we must take it as we find it, and do the best we can to make our way through the minefield of life using whatever equipment our genes have provided to us to get to the other side in one piece. What is so extraordinary about the view of an external environment set for us by nature and essentially unchangeable, except in the sense that we might ruin it and destroy the delicate balance that nature has created in our absence, is that it's completely in contradiction to what we actually know about organisms and environments. When we free ourselves of the ideological bias of atomism and reductionism and look squarely at the actual relations between organisms and the world around them, we find a much richer set of relations and one that has very different consequences for social and political action than are usually supposed. What is the actual relationship between organisms and the environment? First, there is no environment in some independent and abstract sense. Just as there is no organism without an environment, 
there's no environment without an organism. Organisms do not experience environments, they create them. They construct their own environments out of the bits and pieces of the physical and biological world, and they do so by their own life activities. Are the stones and the grass in my garden part of the environment of a bird? The grass is certainly part of the environment of a Phoebe, who gathers dry grass to make a nest. But the stone around which the grass is growing means nothing to that Phoebe. On the other hand, the stone is part of the environment of a thrush, who may come along with a garden snail and break the shell of the snail against the stone. Neither the grass nor the stone are part of the environment of a woodpecker, who's living in a hole in a tree at the base of the garden. That is, bits and pieces of the world outside of these organisms are made relevant to them by their own life activities. If you use grass to make a nest, then the grass is part of your environment. If you use stones to break snails on, then stones are a part of your environment. There's an infinity of ways in which parts of the world can be assembled to make an environment. So how do we know what the environment of an organism is? In fact, we consult the organism. Not only do we consult the organism, but when we describe the environment, we describe it in terms of the organism's actual behavior and life activities. If you're in any doubt of this, you might try asking a professional ecologist to describe the environment of some bird. She or he will say something like the following. Well, the bird builds its nest three feet off the ground in hardwoods. It eats insects part of the year, but then may switch to seeds and nuts when insects are no longer available. It flies south in the winter and comes back north in the summer. And when it's foraging for its food, it tends to stay in the higher branches and at their outer tips, and so on, and so on. Notice that every word uttered by my ecologist in describing the environment of the bird will be a description of the actual life activities of the bird. That process of description reflects the fact that the ecologist has learned what the environment of the bird is by watching birds. A practical demonstration of the difficulty of describing an environment without having seen the organism that created it is the case of the Mars lander. When the United States decided to send a landing module to Mars, biologists wanted to know if there was any life there. So the problem was, how do you design a machine to detect life on Mars? There are several interesting suggestions. One is to send a kind of microscope with a long, sticky tongue that would unroll on the surface of Mars and then roll back up again and put whatever dust it found there under a microscope. If there was anything that looked like a living organism, one could see it in the images sent back to Earth. One might call this the morphological definition of life. If it looks right and it wiggles, then it's alive. What appears to be a more sophisticated approach was actually taken. Instead of asking whether things look alive, it was decided to ask whether they do what living things do. So the Mars lander contained a variant of what was called the wolf trap after one of its inventors, Wolf Vishniak. The wolf trap was essentially a long hose attached to a vacuum cleaner, inside of which was a container of radioactive chicken soup. When the lander got to Mars, it would suck up some dust into the chicken soup, and if there was any living organism in the dust, those organisms would break down the chicken soup as bacteria do on Earth. Then, radioactive carbon dioxide would be produced, and a detector in the machine would signal the presence of this radioactive carbon dioxide. In fact, that's exactly what happened. When the Mars lander sucked up the dust, radioactive carbon dioxide was produced in a pattern that had everybody convinced that there was life on Mars fermenting the chicken soup. But then suddenly, the process stopped, and there wasn't any further fermentation. It just shut down suddenly. This wasn't what living organisms were supposed to do, and the consequence was that people were confused. A conference was held at MIT to debate the issue and decide whether or not there was life on Mars. The decision was that there wasn't any, and that what was really going on was a kind of chemical reaction on finely divided clay particles that one doesn't ordinarily see on Earth. Later on, this reaction was actually mimicked in the laboratory, so everybody has now agreed that they voted correctly and that there's no life on Mars. The problem with this experiment is precisely the one about organisms defining their own environments. How do you know whether there's life on Mars? What you do is you present Martian life with an environment and you see whether they live in it. But how can we know what the environment of Martian life is unless we've seen Martian organisms? All the experiment showed was 
that there's no Earth-like life on Mars. We may know the temperature, the gas content of the atmosphere, and the humidity, and something about the soil on Mars, but we don't know what a Martian environment is like because the environment doesn't consist of temperature, gas, moisture, and soil. It consists of an organized set of relationships among bits and pieces of the world, an organization that has been created by living Martian organisms themselves, if they exist. We must replace Darwin's adaptationist view of life with a constructionist one. It's not that organisms find environments and either adapt themselves to them or die. They actually construct their environments out of bits and pieces. In this sense, the environment of organisms is coded in their DNA. And we find ourselves in a kind of reverse Lamarckian position. Whereas Lamarck supposed that changes in the external world would cause changes in the internal structures, we see that the reverse is true. An organism's genes, to the extent that they influence what the organism does in its behavior, physiology, and morphology, are at the same time helping to construct an environment. So, if genes change in evolution, the environment of the organism will change too. Consider the immediate environment of a human being. If one takes motion pictures of a person with the right sort of optics, called Schlieren optics, one can actually see that there's a layer of warm, moist air that completely surrounds each one of us and that is slowly rising from our legs and bodies and going off the top of our heads. Every living organism including trees, has this boundary layer of warm air that's created by the metabolism of the organism itself. The consequence is that we are encapsulated in a little atmosphere created by our own metabolic activities. That, in fact, is the source of the so-called wind chill factor. The reason it gets much colder when the wind blows across us is because the wind is blowing away that boundary layer, and our skins are then exposed to the outer stratosphere, and we experience a very different set of temperatures and humidities. Now let's think about a mosquito feeding on the surface of a human body. That mosquito is completely immersed in the boundary layer that we've constructed. It's living in a warm, moist world. But one of the most common evolutionary changes for all kinds of organisms is a change in size. And over and over again, organisms have evolved to be larger. If the mosquito species begins to evolve to a larger size, it may in fact find itself with its back in the stratosphere and only up to its knees in the warm, moist boundary layer while it's feeding. The consequence will be that the mosquito's evolution has put it into an entirely different world. Moreover, as human beings early in their evolution lost hair and changed the distribution of sweat glands over their bodies, the thickness of that boundary layer changed. So the evolutionary changes in the genes of human beings changed the world in which they lived making it rather less hospitable for fleas, mosquitoes, and other parasites that live on hairy animals. The first rule of the real relationship between organisms and environment is that environments do not exist in the absence of organisms, but are constructed by them out of bits and pieces of the external world. The second rule is that the environment of organisms is constantly being remade during the life of those living beings. When plants send down roots, they change the physical nature of the soil in which they are living, breaking it up and aerating it. And they exude chemicals that change the soil's chemical nature as well. They make it possible for various beneficial fungi to live together with and to penetrate their root systems. They change the height of the water table by pulling up water. They alter the humidity in their immediate neighborhood. And the upper leaves of plants change the amount of light that's available to the lower leaves. When the Canada Department of Agriculture takes weather records for agricultural purposes, they don't set up a weather station in an open field or on the roof of a building. They take measurements of temperature and humidity at various levels above the ground in a field of growing plants, because the plants are constantly changing the actual physical conditions that are relevant to agriculture. Moles burrow in the soil. Earthworms, through their castings, completely change the local topology. Beavers have had at least as an important effect on the landscape in North America as humans did until the beginning of the last century. Every breath you take removes oxygen and adds carbon dioxide to the world. Mort Saul once said, Remember, no matter how cruel and nasty and evil you may be, 
Every time you take a breath, you make a flower happy. Every single living creature is in a constant process of changing the world in which it lives by taking up materials and putting out others. Every act of consumption is an act of production, and every act of production is an act of consumption. When we consume food, we produce not only gases, but solid waste products that are in turn the materials for the consumption of some other organism. A consequence of the universality of environmental change induced by the life activity of organisms is that every organism is both producing and destroying the conditions of its own existence. There's a lot of talk about how we as human beings are destroying the environment. But we're not unique in the fact that our life processes are recreating the world in a way that is in part hostile to the continuation of our lives. Every bacterium uses up food material and excretes waste products that are toxic to it. Organisms not only ruin the world for their own lives, but for their children as well. The entire vegetational landscape in New England where I live is a consequence of that process. The forest primeval in New England consisted of a mixture of whispering pines and hemlocks and hardwoods. As agriculture spread at the end of the 18th and through the 19th century, all of those forests were cut down and replaced by farms. Then, just before and after the Civil War, there were wholesale migrations out of the rocky soils of New England, where you could hardly plant a crop, to the deep and productive and hospitable soils of the Middle West. As a result, farms were abandoned and plants started to infiltrate into these old fields. The first thing that came in was a variety of weeds and herbs, and these were replaced later by white pines. White pines can form an almost pure stand in an old field, and many such pure white pine stands could be seen in New England earlier in this century. Unfortunately, they don't last. The pines make a dense shade which is inhospitable to the growth of their own seedlings. And because of this shade intolerance, the pines can't replace each other. As the pines die, or if, as in New England, they were cut wholesale, what comes in are hardwoods, whose seedlings have been waiting around for just a little opening. The white pines disappear forever, with the exception of an occasional old tree, and a composition similar to the prehistoric virgin forest appears. This old field white pine hardwood succession, as it's called, is a consequence of the fact that the conditions of light and soil are changed by the pine trees in such a way that their own offspring can't succeed them in the same place. The generation gap, you see, is not simply a human phenomenon. So we must put away the notion that out there is a constant and fixed world that we're uniquely disturbing and destroying. We're certainly changing it as all organisms do. And we certainly have a power that other organisms do not have, both to change the world extremely rapidly and by willful activity to change the world in various ways that we may think beneficial. Nevertheless, we cannot live without changing the environment. That is the second law of the relationship between organism and environment. Third, organisms actually determine how the fluctuations of nature may have an impact on themselves. Organisms are capable of averaging over time and buffering out the fluctuations in physical factors. An important example is the way in which animals and plants store sunlight. Even though the conditions for growth and good nutrition do not exist all year round in a temperate zone, it's not only farmers who make hay while the sun shines. Potatoes are the storage organs of potato plants, and acorns form the storage for oak trees, or at least for their offspring. Other organisms, in turn, use these storage devices for their own storage. So, squirrels store away acorns for use in the winter, and human beings store away potatoes. As human beings, we have even a further level of averaging, which is called money. Money is the way in which, through futures contracts, for example, Fluctuations in the availability of natural products are ironed out for the market. And savings banks are where we put money away for a rainy day. So organisms do not, in fact, perceive, at a physiological level, much of the fluctuation that goes on in external nature. Conversely, organisms have techniques of reacting to the rates of change of the external world 
rather than just the actual levels of the resources. Water fleas are sometimes sexual and sometimes asexual in their reproduction. They change from non-sexual reproduction to sexual reproduction when a drastic change occurs in the environment and they produce males rather than the females that were the exclusive makeup of the species before. That drastic change may be in the amount of oxygen in the water or the change in its temperature or a change in food availability. They don't alter from non-sexual to sexual when the temperature is high or when it's low, but when it changes rapidly in either direction. They are detectors of change, pure and simple. Our visual system is also a very sensitive detector of change. Our central nervous system, by a complex processing of images, enables us to see differences in intensity of light across edges in a way that's far superior to what any physical and electronic device can do. We accomplish this by magnifying differences across small distances. Thus, we have greater visual acuity than any optical scanning machinery. The third rule, then, of organism and environment is that fluctuations in the world only matter as organisms perceive and transform them. Finally, organisms actually change the basic physical nature of signals that come to them from the external world. As the temperature in this studio rises, partly because of the activity in which I'm now engaged, my liver detects that temperature change, but not as a rise in temperature. It detects it as a change in the concentration of sugar in my blood and the concentration of certain hormones. So it begins outside as a change in the rate of vibration of air molecules, a change in temperature, is converted inside my body into a change in the concentration of certain chemical substances. And this has all occurred because of the nature of my genes, which have a strong influence on the anatomy and physiology responsible for that change in physical signal. When I'm out in the desert doing my field work and I hear and see a rattlesnake, those rarefactions of the air that impinge on my eardrums and those photons of light that come into my eye are changed by my central nervous system into a chemical signal and suddenly my adrenaline starts to flow. But those vibrations and photons would be changed to a very different chemical signal in the body of another snake that's receiving exactly the same sights and sounds. That's especially true if it were a snake of the opposite sex and a very different hormone would be induced. But this difference in transformation of one signal into another is coded in my genes and in the genes of the snake. So the last rule of the relationship between organism and environment is that the very physical nature of the environment, as it is relevant to the organism, is determined by the organism itself. Now it might be objected that this interactive picture of organism and environment is all very well, but it ignores some obvious aspects of the external world over which we have no control. A human being may have discovered the law of gravitation, but he certainly didn't pass it. You can't fight gravity. But that, in fact, is not true. A bacterium living in liquid does not feel gravity because it's so small and its buoyant properties free it from what's essentially a very weak force. But the size of a bacterium is a consequence of its genes. And so it's the genetic difference between us and bacteria that determines whether or not the force of gravitation is or is not relevant to us. On the other hand, bacteria feel a universal physical force that we don't. And that's the force of what's called Brownian motion, the constant bombardment of all the air molecules that are moving around and striking us. Precisely because bacteria is so small, they're battered from one side to the other by the motion of these molecules. We fortunately are not constantly reeling from one side of the room to the other because we're so large. All the forces of nature depend for their influence on size, distance, and time duration. But how large an organism is, how rapidly it alters its state and position, how far it is from other organisms of different sizes and kinds are all deeply influenced by those organisms' genes. And so, in a very important sense, the physical forces of the world, insofar as they're relevant to living beings, are encoded in those beings' genes. We cannot talk about living organisms as just products of their genes, but we must recognize that the genes interact with the environment in producing the organism 
in its development and activity. But reciprocally, we can't make the mistake of saying that organisms confront an autonomous external world. The environment influences organisms only through interaction with their genes. The internal and the external are inextricably bound up. These facts of the relationship between organism and environment have very important consequences for current political and social movements. There is a widespread perception that in many ways the world is becoming a rather less pleasant and more threatening place to live in. And there's a good possibility that it may grow catastrophically unpleasant in the not too distant future. It may get a lot warmer. A good deal more ultraviolet light may strike us than now does. The world doesn't smell very good. There are all sorts of noxious substances that are the agents of illness and even death. And we recognize all these changes as the consequence of human activity. So it's right that human beings should want to make a world in which they can live happy, healthful, and reasonably long lives. But we can't do that under the banner of save the environment. Because that slogan assumes that there is an environment which has been created by nature and which we in our foolishness are destroying. It assumes, too, that there's such a thing as the balance of nature, that everything is in balance and harmony, and that harmony is only being destroyed by the foolishness and greed of human beings. There's nothing in our knowledge of the world that suggests that there's any particular balance or harmony in it. The physical and biological worlds have been in constant change since the beginning of the Earth. They have been in a state of flux, much of which has been far more drastic than anyone can conceive of at the present time. Indeed, much of what we conceive of as the environment has been creation of living organisms. Our atmosphere is about 18% oxygen and a fraction of a percent carbon dioxide. That is, the atmosphere which we all breathe and which we hope we can continue to breathe. But that atmosphere was not on Earth before living organisms. On the contrary, most of the oxygen was bound up in chemicals and there was a very large amount of carbon dioxide. Because oxygen is a very unstable compound and simply doesn't exist in a free form if you simply leave it alone. The carbon dioxide was removed from the original atmosphere and deposited in limestone and in chalk by the action of algae and bacteria during the early history of the Earth. The oxygen, which was not present at all, was put into the atmosphere by the activity of the early plants. Present-day animals and plants have evolved in a world made for them by the earlier organisms. Only 60,000 years ago, Canada was completely under the ice, as was the middle of the United States. The environment has never existed, and there has never been balance or harmony. 99.999% of all species that ever existed are already extinct, and in the end, all will become extinct. Indeed, life is about half over. Our estimates are that the very first living organisms appeared on Earth on the order of three or four billion years ago. And we know from stellar evolution that our sun is going to expand and burn up the Earth in another three or four billion years, putting an end to everything. So, any rational environmental movement has got to abandon the romantic and totally unfounded ideological commitment to our harmonious and balanced world in which the environment is preserved. Instead, it's got to turn its attention to the real question, which is, how do people want to live, and how are they to arrange that they live that way? For example, the demand for biodegradable materials has to be understood as a demand for the use of things that people want to preserve. For example, if we get rid of plastics and replace them by paper or wood, we have to cut down more forests. But if we cut down more forests, we will have a greater greenhouse effect because the forests will not be fixing the carbon dioxide. The important point is not that we should go on with our industrial enterprises as we are doing now, but that every demand for a change in the direction of development be analyzed not as a demand for the cessation of change, but as a demand for the reorientation of the direction of change. Everything changes. Nothing remains the same. In the words of Herbert Spencer, change is a beneficent necessity. So, 
human beings are not unique in the way in which they make a radical change in the world. But they do have a unique property not shared by other organisms. It's not the destructive property, a property which is shared by all organisms, but the property that they can plan the changes that will occur in the world. They can't stop the world from changing, but they may be able, with appropriate social organization, to divert those changes in a more beneficial direction, and so perhaps even postpone their extinction for a few hundred thousand years. Is it within the biological capability of human beings to reorganize their futures? This question brings us back again to the issue of human nature and its biological determination. If sociobiologists are right, then human beings have limitations coded in their genes, which make them individually entrepreneurial, selfish, aggressive, xenophobic, family-oriented, driven towards dominance, self-interested in a way that precludes any real possibility for a radical reorganization of society. You can't fight human nature. On the other hand, if Prince Kropotkin were right, that biologically human beings were impelled toward cooperation and have been artificially held away from it historically, then such a reorganization might be possible. So it would seem that indeed we do need to know the truth about individual human biological limitations. After all, how can we transcend the limitations that are part of our biological nature? In his book on sociobiology, Professor Wilson says, if the decision is taken to mold cultures to fit the requirements of the ecological steady state, some behaviors can be altered experientially without emotional damage or loss in creativity, but others cannot. We do not know how many of the most valued qualities are linked genetically to the more obsolete destructive ones. Cooperativeness towards group mates might be coupled with aggressivity towards strangers, creativeness with a desire to own and dominate. If the planned society, the creation of which seems inevitable in the coming century, were deliberately to steer its members past those stresses and conflicts that once gave the destructive phenotypes their Darwinian edge, the other phenotypes might dwindle with them. In this, the ultimate genetic sense, social control would rob man of his humanity. It appears, then, that we need to know what the genetic linkages are between the various aspects of an individual's behavior. Because if we don't, we may, in our blundering attempts to create a better world, ruin it altogether. Perhaps we really had better sequence the entire human genome, as so many molecular biologists want to do, because that's a first step, although an insufficient one, to understanding what human limitations might be. This demand for biological information implies that society needs to be guided in the end by a technocratic elite who understands genetics. What's even worse is that it totally confounds the properties and limitations of individuals with the properties and limitations of the social institutions that they create. It is the ultimate political manifestation of the belief that individual autonomous units determine the properties of the collectivities in which they assemble. But when we actually look around at society, we see that the opposite is true. If we have to characterize social organization and its consequences, it is that social organization does not reflect the limitations of individual biological beings, but it negates those limitations. No individual human being can fly by flapping his or her arms and legs. That's indeed a biological limitation, having to do with our size and the size of our appendages. Nor could human beings fly if a very large number of them all got together in one room and all flapped their arms and legs together. Yet I did fly to Toronto to record these lectures. I flew as a consequence of social action. Airplanes and airports are products of educational institutions, of scientific discoveries, of the organization of money, of the production of petroleum and its refining, metallurgy, the training of pilots, the actions of government in creating air traffic control systems, all of which are social products. Those social products have come together to make it possible for me as an individual to fly. It's important to note that although they're social products, it's not society that flies. Society can't fly. Individuals fly, but they fly as a consequence of social organization. 
Sherlock Holmes once explained to Dr. Watson that he didn't know whether the sun went around the earth or the earth went around the sun because it didn't make any difference whatsoever to his affairs. He analogized his mind to a kind of attic in which he could put just a certain amount of lumber and every new fact added had to displace an old one. And he was absolutely right. There's indeed a limit to what any human being can remember. If by remember you mean the number of things that one can pull out of one's head. No historian of health and disease can remember all the bills of mortality, all the demographic statistics since the 19th century. Yet historians do remember those facts because they can look them up in books. And books are a social product, as are the libraries that hold them. So social activity makes it possible for us to remember what no human being could remember as an isolated entity. Individual biological limitations, understood from viewing individuals as isolated entities in a vacuum, are not individual limitations for individuals embedded in society. It's not that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. It's that the properties of the parts cannot be understood except in their context in the whole. Parts do not have individual properties in some isolated sense. They only have properties in the context in which they are found. But the biological theory of human nature misses the point because it searches for that nature in the products of genes and individuals and the limitations of individuals caused by those genes, or it searches for them in the properties of an external world which are fixed and which cannot be altered except in a destructive way. It is indeed the case that human, social, and political organization is a reflection of our biological being. For after all, we are material biological objects developing under the influence of the interaction of our genes with the external world. It's certainly not the case that our biology is irrelevant to social organization. The question is, what part of our biology is relevant? If one were to choose a simple biological property of human beings that was of supreme importance, it would be our size. The fact that we are somewhere between five and six feet tall has made all of human life possible as we know it. Gulliver's Lilliputians, who were said to be six inches tall, could not in fact have had the civilization that he ascribed to them. Because six inch tall human beings, no matter how they were shaped and how they were formed, could not have created the rudiments of a technological civilization. For example, they couldn't have smelted iron. They couldn't have mined minerals because a six inch tall being couldn't get sufficient kinetic energy from swinging a tiny pickaxe to break rocks. That's why when babies fall, they don't hurt themselves. It's not that they're so relaxed. It's because they aren't very big. Nor could the Lilliputians have controlled fire because the tiny twigs that they could bring to a fire would burn up instantly. Nor could they have even thought about mining or have been able to speak because their brains would have been physically too small. It takes a central nervous system of a certain size to have enough connections and enough complexity for speech. Ants may be terribly strong and terribly clever for their size, but their size alone guarantees that they'll never write books about people. The most important fact about human genes is that they help to make us as big as we are and to have a central nervous system with as many connections as it has. But there are not enough genes to determine the shape and structure of that nervous system, nor of the consciousness, which is an aspect of that structure. Yet it is that consciousness that creates the environment in which we live, its history, and the direction of its future. This then provides us with a correct understanding of the relation between genes and the shape of our lives. Our DNA is a powerful influence on our anatomies and physiologies. In particular, it makes possible the complex brain that characterizes human beings. But having made that brain possible, the genes have made possible human nature, a social nature whose limitations and possible shapes we do not know, except insofar as we know what human consciousness has already made possible. In Simone de Beauvoir's clever but deep apothegm, a human being is l'être dont l'être de n'être pas, the being whose essence is not having an essence. History far transcends any narrow limitations that are claimed for either the power of genes or the power of the environment to circumscribe us. Like the House of Lords, that destroyed its own power to limit the political development of Britain 
by the successive reform acts to which it assented, so the genes, in making possible the development of human consciousness, have surrendered their power both to determine the individual and its environment. They have been replaced by an entirely new level of causation, that of social interaction, with its own laws and its own nature that can only be understood and explored through that uniquely human form of experience, social action. This has been the concluding segment of the 1990 Massey Lectures, presented by Richard C. Lewinton.